between this type of entity and this entity. Yes. Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to Kohakon Day 3. Uh, thank you to everyone who's back in the room and back joining us. Uh, some of those diehards who've, who've taken leave from work or are pulling an all-nighter all -nighter overseas to join us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, before we start today, I will do my daily health and safety briefing and have decided that the day of the same jokes is definitely not appropriate, so I'll just skip them entirely today, post apologising for them. <laughs> I've got no new emergency material. Thankfully, that's a good thing. No new emergency experiences to call upon today. So... Uh, firstly, this is all for everyone in person. Um, every, oh no, it's a new joke. Oh, I can't say it now. I've just, I've just um, <laughs> said I was going to say a joke, so I won't do that. Good morning, everyone. All right. In the event of a fire alarm, please make your way out of the auditorium entrance, turn right, and exit the building via the Aitken Street entrance you came in. If you are in the seminar rooms, please also use the same exit, which is to the right when you exit those rooms. Once you are outside on Aitken Street, turn left, follow the footpath for 100 metres and gather outside the construction site on the left side of the road. In the event of an earthquake, immediately assume the brace position in your seat, or if you are standing, drop cover and hold. If you are in the seminar rooms, please move away from the windows and take cover underneath the furniture if you can. There are some desks on the other side of the room. We could find a place under, I hope. Once the shaking has stopped, wait for instructions from the venue staff as evacuation may not be necessary. And in the event of any other alert or emergency, please stay calm and wait for instructions from the venue staff. Uh, and just briefly on bathrooms, there are um, bathrooms located near the Aitken Street exit. Um, so where you, if you're heading out the exit there on your right, 
And there are also bathrooms at the opposite end of the uh, foyer, just past the stairs, um, and there's some signage in those ones. Um, are not labelled as to who can go in, so everyone can choose any toilet they please. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, also, just briefly before we start the day, the uh, Twitter hashtag for the conference is hash kohakon20. We are using a platform called Slido for questions, sli.do, and again using the hashtag hash kohakon20. So, without further ado, it is my huge pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker and our very good friend and colleague, Julia Serrano. Excuse me while I rustle the paper very briefly. Julius is an accessibility consultant at Catalyst IT. He has been working in accessibility for 14 years and has performed tests and audits for agencies such as ACC, the New Zealand Defence Force, the Electoral Commission, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Justice and the Department of Internal Affairs. Julius has conducted accessibility trainings and workshops in New Zealand and Asia and has trained over 200 people on accessibility and assistive technologies. And many of us um, in the room from Catalyst have been lucky enough to be on the receiving end of that training. Outside of work, Julius is also a motivational speaker and practitioner of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So it's my huge pleasure to introduce Julius now. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. I hope you are well. Um, hello to everybody here. Hello to everybody watching the live stream. I hope you are well. And I am Julio Serrano. I'm an accessibility practice lead. This means that I lead a team of business analysts, front end developers, QA testers, and visual designers. High performing individuals who make the internet a more open, inclusive and accessible place for everybody. I'm so grateful to be here. And my topic for this presentation is called Web Accessibility for Your Online Libraries. Before doing that, um, I'd like to share something because as much as I love doing accessibility work, I am a father and a husband. And several months ago, it was a very challenging time for me because I am totally blind, and my wife is totally blind as well. We were looking after our two-year-old daughter, who is sighted. And during that challenging time in lockdown, we were blessed and thankful because we were able to provide an entertaining, educational, and even a magical time for our daughter. How, do we, how did we do it? It was through the help of online libraries, particularly that of the Blind Foundation. Through the materials, the Braille materials that we received, we were able to provide an entertaining several weeks, a magical and educational several weeks for our daughter. That's why I have a huge amount of respect, appreciation, and gratitude for online libraries. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. Your work enhances lives, enriches lives, even the lives of little ones. So thank you for that. And with that, I'd like to, in my little way, share how exactly online libraries would be able to make their services more open, inclusive, and accessible for everybody. Let me provide an overview of the presentation that we'll have this morning, Slideshow. today. So the title, again, is Web Accessibility for Your Online Libraries. I am using a screen reader because I'm totally blind, and you're going to hear more of it in this presentation. Quick overview of the talk that we'll be having. Circle. I'll provide a quick intro of accessibility, what it is, why it's important, and who benefits from accessibility. Circle P accessible. 
we'll go through five important key accessibility guidelines with examples, and then we'll provide you with your exciting next step to move forward to learn more about accessibility. I trust that you can see the slides right now. So what is web accessibility? It is a practice, first of all. It's a practice of making web content accessible to people with disabilities. Web content includes your online forms, your HTML documents, PDFs, audio, video, basically anything that you can download and access from your online libraries. People with disabilities include people who are totally blind, people with low vision, so you have sighted people but have limited vision. You also have people with hearing impairments, people who are totally deaf, and people who are hard of hearing. You also have people with cognitive disabilities, people who find it difficult to remember things, people who take a longer time to learn things. You also have people with limited fine motor skills, people with motor disabilities. These people may be sighted, but they cannot use the mouse because they have limited fine motor skills. You also have people with print disabilities, such as people with dyslexia. All of these people will benefit from your accessible online library content. Measurement. Accessibility is a measurement. It is a degree to which people with disabilities can access your online libraries. So high accessibility means that more people will be able to access your content um, and perform the transactions that you have in your online libraries. Low accessibility will mean that uh, people will have a challenge browsing your catalog, for instance, or even performing any transaction in your library. So it is a measurement. To be implemented. The best thing that you can do for accessibility is to start it early in the project. Think of it this way. When you're building the physical structure of your online library, you don't finish everything and then think, hmm, where do we put the wheelchair ramps now? You basically include accessibility while you are developing your content. Similar to you know, building the aforementioned wheelchair ramp, you include it while you are still building the structure. That's the best thing that you can do for accessibility. Well, it, benefits everyone. it benefits everybody. Well, it be implemented. Well, um, accessibility also benefits people who do not have disabilities. The best example for this is video captions. Video captions, these are the text equivalent for the audio, the dialogues, the dialogue on the video that you can watch, mainly provided for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. People who do not have hearing impairments will still benefit from video captions when they are in a noisy environment. So if you are in a noisy pub, for instance, and you're trying to access a video content that has captions, although you, don't, you may not have hearing impairments, you'll still benefit from this accessible feature. Well, it benefits everyone. So after talking about a quick introduction of what accessibility is, what's in it for online libraries if they practice, if you practice accessible content? First reason, more people can access your content. 24% of people in New Zealand have some form of disability. You're going to be able to open this, your online library content to this to this large group of people when you make your content accessible. Also, people with disabilities are some of the most passionate people online. If they find that your online library is accessible, they're going to recommend it to their friends, they're going to tweet about it and make posts and blog posts about it. Well, it compliance with web. Second point, compliance with web, uh, with web standards. New Zealand has its own web accessibility standards and it draws heavily from the international guidelines. So if in turn you focus on the international guidelines, which is called Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1, you will be able to comply with most likely your country's 
web, web accessibility standard. Improved usability. improved usability and search engine optimization. There are accessibility principles that overlap with principles of usability and user experience, as well as search engine optimization. Later on, we'll point out some specific examples of this. But it is just important to note that if you make your content accessible, you're also going to make it usable, user-friendly, and search engine optimized. Compatible with accessible, accessible content is compatible with web technologies. People who use older browsers will benefit from your accessible content. At the same time, people who browse the internet via a slow connection will also benefit from your accessible content. Specific examples will be cited later. Social responsibility. Finally, accessibility is the right thing to do. When you make your online libraries accessible, you're going to demonstrate to everybody that you took the time to understand the needs of people with special needs and to provide content that they can access, enjoy, and even in the long run, contribute to. Those are just the benefits of accessible content. Here's a quick overview of how people with disabilities use the internet. Blind people use screen readers. Screen readers are a type of software whose main output is a semi-human, semi-robotic voice that speaks the highlighted text on the screen. I hope to uh, let you experience the magic of screen readers in this presentation when we show the examples later on. It's very important to note that in addition to totally blind people, you also have people, other people with disabilities who use screen readers. People with cognitive disabilities who are sighted, who prefer to listen to content, also use screen readers. People who are sighted but have limited vision who want to save their eyesight would normally use screen readers as well. So it's not just people who are totally blind who use screen readers. Low vision, colon. People who are low vision use screen magnification software. Now, you may have experienced using the zoom feature in your mobile device or your laptop in order to support easier reading. So that's the main technology being used by people who have low vision. Colon. People who are deaf or hard of hearing rely on visual alerts and captions. Visual alerts include change of color, message box and change of context in terms of text size as well as pop-ups and modals. Video captions include the textual equivalent of the audio, the dialogue, and basically any conversation that exists inside videos. Motor disability. People with motor disabilities, these are people who cannot use the mouse because they have limited fine motor skills. These people mainly use the keyboard. A certain group of people with motor disabilities also use speech recognition software. You may have also experienced this, um, the uh, specific handy software that would enable you to use the microphone to verbally instruct the speech recognition software to open an application and to input data in your text area. Motor disabilities. So after talking about how people with disabilities um, interact with the computer and the internet, let, me, let us show you the how of accessibility. In this presentation, we'll provide one, two, three, five key accessibility contents. So it is very important to note that there are lots of accessibility guidelines, especially if you look at the international guidelines. However, if you apply these five key accessibility guidelines in your online library, you've already, already made a huge step in making your online library content accessible to everybody. Let's start with descriptive images. Why are we doing this? We are doing this for people who use screen readers. Now, you now know that screen reader users include people who are totally blind 
It also includes people with cognitive disabilities who use screen readers as they prefer to listen to the content. So how do we make our, descript how our images descriptive? descriptive bullet, provide alt text. It's all about providing alt text in the alt attribute. Now, if, if you work on code, if, or if you know someone who works on the source code for your online library, please do encourage them to provide descriptive images via the alt attribute of the images. Make sure that the alt text is concise but informative. Please do leave out the photo of part. You don't need to include photo of or image of because it is going to be already spoken by the screen reader descriptively. If you have interactive elements such as print icons, help icons, and search icons, describe the function of the image rather than describing what the print icon looks like because the people who use screen readers need to know what the image performs because it is interactive. Decorative images. If you have spacers, horizontal bars, vertical bars, and all other decorative goodness in your web pages, make sure that you are providing null value for your alt text. This means you, need, you just simply need to provide alt equals quotes. This is because people who use screen readers do not actually need to know that there's decorative images because they don't add any content to your online library um, pages. Let me show you a set of pages to demonstrate the accessibility or lack thereof of the content. This is the first example. Now I trust that you can see the web page on the screen. The main uh, content contains an online menu. The online menu, let me just increase the volume of the screen reader and slow down the speech. So I'm going to focus the cursor on the first page of this online menu. So let me... The screen reader said graphic and then a, a random set of um, letters. I think it's C-O-F. This is an example of a, an image which should have provided much, much, much more content. However, since it does not have any image description, the screen reader, I think, it just defaulted into probably reading the file name of this um, image right here. This is an example of an image that does not have any text description. Hence, I'm not able to access this online menu. Let's go to another example. Doug Wilson. So in this example, we're still talking about descriptive images. I'm going to fo go to Clickable. the main content main and Close dash up. focus on this particular image. Now, question, do you see the image on the screen? Thank you. So let me make the screen reader speak the alt text provided by the content manager of this website right here. Graphic close dash up of the doctor hand pointing to the brain CT. So it says close up of the doctor's hand pointing to the brain CT. Um, this is an example of an image that has been provided with descriptive, uh, uh, with text description. So I was only able to know the purpose of this image, which contains a close-up of the doctor's hand pointing at the, um, at the brain CT image because the web developers or the content managers were um, kind enough to provide text description for the image. So this is an example of an image that is accessible. Let's move on to the next key guideline. Oh, before we move on to the next key guideline, an important point is that people who use, people who browse the internet via a slow connection will benefit from text descriptions. How? This is because usually people who browse the internet via a slow connection would turn off images 
in their web page, in their um, browser. So in that um, situation, if, you, if your online libraries still have descriptive text images, people who browse the internet via slow connection will still be able to understand the purpose of your content because of the image descriptions that you provide. Slideshow keyboard dash except bulleted. Next key guideline is keyboard accessible elements. This will benefit people who have limited fine motor skills as well as blind people who use screen readers because they essentially have the same need. They use the keyboard 100% of the time. So again, totally blind people who use screen readers use the keyboard. I do not use the mouse. People with limited fine motor skills who may be sighted, they also use the keyboard because they cannot use the mouse. How do you make this, your, how do you make your content accessible to these people? Bullet tip, bullet. Make sure that all of your functionality is accessible via the keyboard. This means that we highly recommend to make sure that your input fields, radio buttons, option lists, buttons, anything that is interactive in your online library, make sure they are all accessible via the keyboard. Tip. Bullet tip, colon. Unplug your mouse and then just explore using the tab key. The tab key will enable you to move from one interactive element to another. Shift tab will um, enable you to move to the previous element. Space bar or enter will enable you to activate the element. If you find that all of your interactive elements can be accessed using the tab key, can be activated using enter and space, Congratulations, your web page is keyboard accessible. On the other hand, if you find that you have specific interactive elements that cannot be accessed using the keyboard, you may need to work on the accessibility of your page. Bullet tip. Example. Doug will, Doug will, one new case of com, Doug will, one contact us. Okay, so we're talking about keyboard accessible elements. With graphic editor, what? Here is an online form. Explore this with me. So I'm on the first part of the online form. I'm pressing the tab key. Edit require, edit require, edit I'm moving edit through the content com rather quickly. Combo box, a combo box, edit required, invalid entry, multi-line message. I'm on the message input field. I hope that you can also confirm visually that I'm on the message input field. This is where it becomes interesting. If I press the tab key. Submit button. I move to submit. Did I miss anything? I did. So the radio button between the message input field and the submit button is an example of content that is not keyboard accessible. This is because using the tab key, I was not able to reach that radio button, whatever that radio button is. I'll never know. Next, um, before we move on, I, I just want to, to honor you and, and celebrate you for, for learning, for, for taking the time to learn about accessible content. Um, you know, you, by, by simply knowing and implementing the two previous accessibility guidelines, you've already done so much for people with disabilities. Here is the next guideline. Slide show that accessible forms. Accessible forms. Now, especially with online libraries, there's a huge, huge chance that you will be making use of accessible forms. So, of forms, online forms. So, how do you make them accessible? Bullet labels and input. Make sure that your labels are programmatically associated with your input fields. If you're working on source code, or if you know someone who works on the source code of your online libraries, the best thing that you can do is to use the for, F-O-R, attribute to create relationship between the label and the input field, okay? Um, there are also other ways to ensure accessible content, uh, accessible forms, but that's the best thing, to use the for attribute to establish relationship between label and input field. Bullet tab order is logical. Make sure also, when it comes to making your forms accessible, that tab order is logical. Um, this is also, this also can be tested using the tab key. 
So if you press the tab key to explore the online form, and if you see that the focus moves from one area to another via a logical sequence, you've already confirmed that the tab order is correct. Let's have some examples of... Okay, so we're talking about accessible forms. Let me just... Awesome. Okay, so we're talking about accessible forms. This is the Trade Me registration page. Now, the main issue here is that sin because the label was not programmatically associated with the input field, the screen reader is not speaking the label. So the screen reader will be able to tell user, myself, that this is an input field because it's saying edit. However, because label is not programmatically associated with input field, edit focus it's not speaking the label. Edit protected blank. I'm moving to the, I think I can only guess that this is the password um, input field, but since edit focus it's not speaking the label, I will not be able to fully understand this. Edit protected blank. Another um, input field. So the main issue here, Label is not properly associated with input field. As a result, screen reader is not speaking the label. Let's move on to another example. eBay search. eBay. Main landmark enter. So in this example, you may hear that the screen reader. Enter keywords or item number. Edit focus. Enter keywords or item number. It's speaking enter keywords or item number. That is the label that I was talking about, which was not programmatically associated in the previous example. In this example, Keyword options, combo box, all words, any order collapsed. The, the label has been programmatically associated with the input fields, with the option lists. As a result, the screen reader is able to speak the label. Therefore, the, the user is informed, can perceive that the purpose of this particular element is keyword options, the keyword options uh, is for keyword options. This is an example of an online form that has been made accessible via the programmatic association between label and input field. Slide bullet tab, slide sufficient color. This is the next guideline, sufficient color contrast. We are doing this for people with limited vision. This basically means that your text color and your background color should have sufficient contrast. So the darker your text, the lighter your background should be. On the other hand, the lighter your text, the darker your background should be. It's very interesting to note that even if you do not have visual impairment, good color contrast will be very important to you even if, again, you don't have visual impairment, but you are browsing online content via a mobile device under sunlight. In that situation, good, good and sufficient color contrast will be beneficial to everybody. E -E -Bay search. Example. Latest news bar Wellington. Wellington Phoenix. Do you notice the navigation bar that is yellow? That, that, that yellow navigation bar has white text. Can anybody confirm that this is correct? So if this looks a little bit off to people who do not have visual impairments, it is going to be twice as challenging to read for people with low vision. Some of the colors, which um, I was speaking to people with low vision, some of the colors that you may need to be especially careful with include light gray, yellow, pink, and light green. Pops light, bullet supports easy, bullet useful tool, cold. This is just one useful tool. If you can brow look up the Web Aims contrast checker, this is a very useful tool that will enable you to enter the hex value of colors that you're using in your online library content and then you can simply check whether or not the contrast um, is accessible according to the international guidelines. 
the web aim contrast checker is just one one example one example among many this is the last key accessibility guideline for today and it is all about proper semantics when you're working on the html of your content make sure that headings use correct tags make sure that lists Cor uh, use correct tags as well as data tables. So when it comes to headings, make sure that you are using the correct H tag. The thing that you want to avoid when it comes to headings is to simply use formatting. Please do not use formatting to make headings look like headings. Um, this is going to be helpful in terms of people who use screen readers. So also for lists, make sure that your lists are using the correct HTML tag, be it ordered lists or unordered lists. Make sure that each list item is included in the proper HTML tag. Bullet list tags for bullet correct data table. Make sure that your data tables cor use correct table headers as well as the other HTML standard tags for data tables. La latest online services. This is an example where we're still talking about proper semantics. And on this page, let me demonstrate to you how helpful it is when the web page uses the correct HTML tags. So the screen reader has a specific feature that enables me to navigate from one type of element to another. This is useful, especially when you're browsing web page that has hundreds of links and you know, more than 50 headings. Access keys for what I'm doing right now is browsing the page via headings. I'm only able to do that because the screen reader has a shortcut key that enables me to navigate from one heading to another. I'm only able to use that shortcut key because the page uses correct heading tags. Table with one rows and one column scam alert. So I'm browsing the page. Motor vehicles heading level two. I was able to hear motor vehicles heading level two. So this is proof that the document uses correct heading semantics. So if I do want to move to the next section of services, because I can hear that motor vehicles is the first section. Driver license in heading level two. I simply press the heading shortcut key provided by the screen reader, which moved me to the next heading, which is heading level two driver licensing. Driver licensing. So because the headings were tagged properly, I was able to make use of them via the heading shortcut key. Final example. Click funnels. Click funnels. So on the top, let me move to the top of the page. Member log. And here is where it becomes interesting. It has lots of text. I've explored that. I, I know that much. But if I use the heading shortcut, no next heading. The screen reader was not able to detect any headings on this page. This is because, although I think there are headings that look like headings, but use formatting. So as an effect, the screen reader and the user, especially, was not able to perceive any headings on no the page. Next heading. No next he so what do I need to do now? I have no other choice but to browse the page line by line just to be able to know what the contents of the page is. I have no option to skip from one section to another. I have to read everything. Slide, bullet correct data take slide show the next steps. Again, I'd like to thank you for for spending the time to learn about accessibility and I'd like to invite you to do the next step. So once now that you've learned so much about accessible content and the five principles of making your online libraries accessible, I'd like to invite you to continue learning Next about step. accessibility Bullet, learn more, colon. by starting to browse the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. Once you browse that page, you might be greeted by a huge document but my recommendation, my suggestion to you is to take it one principle at a time. Also, please know that web content accessibility guidelines have been made very comprehensive because they want to address all situations, all disabilities, 
and all types of elements. That's why it's a long, very long document. You may also be interested to know that not all principles will apply to your online libraries. So just choose what applies to you and then leave the rest. Bullet accessibility training. We also have accessibility training. Um, at Catalyst, we do regular accessibility training for you in order for you to learn more about the specific elements, the specific success criteria that you need to apply to your online libraries. Bullet and finally, we have audits and testing. Accessibility audits involve um, testing pages that have already been created and finished. Testing involves um, making sure that the pages are accessible while they are being developed. So in our time together, we had a discussion about web accessibility. We learned what it is, why it's important, and who exactly benefits from accessible content. We also gave you five key accessibility principles, descriptive images, keyboard accessible elements. Um, you also have accessible forms, sufficient color contrast, and good semantics. So I would like to thank you again for, for your time. I honor your, your interest in accessibility, and I look forward to serving you and hearing from you. Thank you very much. Julius, before you step away, um, heartfelt thanks from all of us here in the room. And um, I can assure you that the, um, the Twitter appreciation of your talk so far has always also been loud and heartfelt, and we're all called to action. So thank you again for being with us today. Thank you again, Julius. Um, yeah, I hope you um, see uh, the, the warm reactions later. I think um, there might be some enthusiasm this weekend in our Hackfest or working together time uh, to... There certainly is from myself. I now know what I'm going to do over the Hackfest um, is, is work on um, some of those accessibility testing tasks that Julius just talked us through. As a non-developer, that's something I can do. So I'm actually really, really excited about the weekend now. Thank you once again, Julius. <laughs> okay, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Um, the name of our next speaker is Rebecca Pilipula. And Rebecca is the Director of Libraries in Turku since 2018. Earlier, she worked as a Director of Juansu Regional Library and has been a member of the board of the Finnish Library Association and a member of IFLA's Public Library Section Standing Committee. She was the deputy chairperson for the Council of Public Libraries and the chairperson also until two, from 2013 to 2017. She's also been the chairperson for the board of Koaha Suomi Limited since the foundation of the company in 2016. So since the, um, since the talk yesterday from Ari and Nisapeka, I anticipate that everyone is really looking forward to hearing another perspective on how titled this talk is titled World's Best Libraries. And after yesterday's talk, I think we're all very much looking forward to hearing more about how that is the case in Finland. Uh, thank you very much. We look forward to your talk, Rebecca. Hello everybody, I'm Rebecca Pilkula from Finland. I'm the director of Turku City Libraries and I'm also chairman of the board of Koha Suomi Limited since the founding of the company it was 2016. I've been working as a library director 
since 2002, first in Joensuu and now I've been in Turku since 2018. So I worked together with Ari Mäkiranta in Joensuu and you, you, you heard yesterday Ari's presentation. He told you shortly about the Koha project of Joensuu and also the founding of our company. But I would like to add some points of view from the library director's point of view. So we started together 2011 in Joensuu. We started the project to evaluate uh, could the open source solution be good enough for us and to the other Finnish libraries. <laughs> because I have to tell you that there were several uh, colleagues of mine that that they just didn't believe that open source solution library system would e never be good enough for the needs of Finnish libraries. For example, we knew that uh, it's quite a Finnish phenomenon uh, to allow customers make reservations to the uh, periodicals and to borrow the magazine copies like any other materials. Uh, we also need the uh, loan history for the needs of home help services of the library. We were also wondering, are the notifications of due dates possible in Koha and um, etc. etc. We had a lot of questions. But most of them were answered and we were ready to jump into the world of open source solutions 2014 in Joensuu. And we started to go with Koha. And Joensuu Regional Library was the first public library to make the transition to Koha in Finland. But we got some friends and they wanted to make the same step. So there were five other libraries or more like to say five other consortiums and they wanted to uh, start cooperation with us and we wanted to share uh, the management work and we wanted to get organized somehow. And it was not an easy task because we all had added a lot of code of our own to implement the features that we were used, used to having in our own library systems. We made several kind of researches and then we de decided to set up a limited company four years ago. It was a little bit scary for me because I'm just an ordinary kind of librarian. I've never done earlier in my working life anything else than these librarian things. So I didn't know anything about shares, limited companies or how to organize a shareholders meeting annually. But after these four years, I know all of these things well enough. I'm not expert, but being good enough, it's totally good for me. But anyway, I promised to tell you about the world's best libraries. And I'm proud to present you the three busiest library buildings in Finland. Yes. The first one, Audi. Audi is the new central library of Helsinki and Helsinki is the capital of Finland. There is um, around 10,000 square meters of public space, three, three floors, and all is open 90 hours per week. Uh, nowadays they have uh, approximately 8,000 visitors per day, but when they started they had over 10,000 visits per day. And I say the public truly has their own building here in this Audi building. It's in the city center and read directly across the square where Audi is is uh, located is Finland's parliament house. And if you go to the Audi's top floor, you are exactly at the same level as the parliament house. So I think it's symbolic, symbolically the public is at an equal level, level with the elected representatives. Time magazine made a list last year about the great places in the world and they put Audi on, on their list. And Audi was nominated the best library of the year last year at IFLAS annual congress. 
Anyway, they are still because there was no IFLAS annual congress this year. Then we'll have the second one. It's a library Omena. It's a Finnish word that means Apple. It's a branch library of Espoo City Library and it's located to in the middle of the very busy uh, shopping center complex. Library was open 2001 and they have very large collections. They have good facilities for information retrieval and there is a lot of cozy surroundings for work, relaxation and they even have a Japanese kind of uh, garden over there. They service policy is based to totally on self-service, borrowing and lending a lot of automation. And they have also self-service opening hours uh, without stuff. So they have um, opening hours with stuff, it's 75 in a week and 12 extra hours without stuff. They have approximately 5,000 visitors per day. And Espoo City Library was nominated for the Library of the Year at London Book, year, Book Fair last year. And then the best one, my own library. Our main library of Turku City Library is the third busiest library building in Finland. We have approximately 4,500 4, visitors per day. And mine is only one of these three libraries that are going to go to use Koha. We are now running the implementation project. And we started last April and Koha will be running in production next May. And Turku City Library is not alone in the project. Turku is part of the Vaski libraries. And Vaski Consortium was founded 2008, and it's a regional collaboration between 18 cities, and we have 56 library units, uh, including five mobile libraries. And Vaski brings many advantages for the customers, just like one library card, one collection, one reservation queue, common rules of use, material transportation free of charge, and one big e-material collection. So this all means that our patrons can use the same library card in every VASCI library. Reservations are free of charge, but uncollected materials are charged with a fee, two euros. Reservations in Finnish libraries must be free of charge according to the Library Act 2017. So you can believe that the amount of the reservations has grown since the latest Library Act. And during this year, the amount of the reservations has almost doubled because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In Finland, libraries closed their doors temporarily on 18th March due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the closure of library premises was initially expected to last until mid-May. But however, the 4th of May, the government allowed all public libraries to restart their lending services immediately. The decision allowed libraries to offer limited services, and that mostly meant that people were allowed to pick, pick up their reservations, whilst the library premises remain largely closed until 1st of June. During this closure and the summer, our patrons changed their way to use the library. Instead of coming to the library and searching the items for the cells, they started to do more and more reservations. The items customers have reserved may be transported from any VASCI library, also free of charge, and returning the items is possible to any library in the area. All this means that we have daily or weekly transportation from different libraries, and the amount of the transportation boxes that arrive at the main library daily 
is around 70 boxes. And it means that appro approximately 7,000 items per day. And about 70% of these items are reservations that need to be handled one by one. And the amount of the transported items is growing all the time. The customer service policy of Vaski libraries is very typical in Finland. Almost 90% of Finnish public libraries are members of the one consortium like Vaski. And they all have similar kind of services. Uh, like this uh, one collection, one library card, the rules and transportation system. I think everyone should have the privilege to say, my library is the best one in the whole world. Actually, quite many people say like that in Finland. According to the customer servers, about 94% of my library's patrons say that Turku City Library does good or excellent work. Especially, they thank the friendly and professional staff, opening hours and smooth service. And if I ask my colleagues how did they customer service go, they say exactly the same things. People are extremely satisfied to their libraries. Uh, Finland is among the top countries in the world in terms of literature and education. The Finnish public library is one of the most advanced and admired in the world, if I may say. Libraries are strongly involved in the implementation of key values of Finnish society, education and equality. Libraries have a traditionally strong role not only as one of the cornerstones of Finnish democracy and education, but also in people's daily lives. Libraries belong to everyone, as they are funded by tax revenue. Finns, they just love their libraries, and they really use their libraries. Finns are avid readers and library users. So last year, the total annual lending was 86 million, items. It means almost 16 items per capita. The annual number of the library visits for was uh, 54 millions, and that meant 11 visits per capita. And the internet services of the libraries were used 47 million times. The total material stock is 40, 34 million items. And there must be a library, public library, in every municipality by the Library Act. And most of them have uh, branch libraries. So there is totally 718 libraries in Finland. And 135 book mobiles. The continuity and quality of library services are protected by legislation. The first Library Act came into effect in 1928, with the latest version effected in 2017. I hope that I've convinced you about the meaning libraries have in common in Finland. Libraries play, play a strong role for all in society as an open, free of charge, low threshold service. Our patrons are used to efficient service with excellent quality. I'm just an ordinary library director, so I don't understand much about the library systems or technology. Mostly I'm concerned about the costs how much the library system will cost. And is the library system efficient enough that my staff will be able to do the customer service as efficient as our patrons are used? You see, there will never be enough money and enough staff to make everything 
just like go like a dream. And I think the library system is the most important tool the librarians have. So it is really important how this tool is working. My library is also one of the founding members of Koha Suomi Limited. So you might wonder why the implementation project is running now and not four years ago like the other ones did. The reason is there were serious doubts about the efficiency of the Koha. Is it fast enough to handle our loans, reservations, patterns and items? The other reason was that does Koha have all the important functions we are used to have in our own library systems? Will we be able to make the service as excellent as we used, uh, used to? At the beginning of the 2016, Vaski libraries made a list of six features that must be able to do with Koha before Vaski libraries will be able to start the implementation project. And then we had the second point and we made the second list and it was last year. But our first list, Finna. Vaski libraries have built web services at Finna interface. And Ari told you yesterday about the Finna cooperation in Finland. And nowadays all the Koha libraries in Finland use only Finna as their user interface. Melinda, uh, the national cataloging platform, and Esapekka told you yesterday about the Melinda cooperation in Finland. We also needed interfaces to online stores of publishers. And we were also quite much worried about uh, several implementations of Koha in Finland. And we would want it to have that there would be only one implementation. And it was because that uh, taking care of those several different kind of implementations took absolutely too much resources. RFID, we had RFID, library cards and items. Will Koha support that? So there was our list. And most of these have been done already. So I think Koha Suomi made an excellent work. It's only this Melinda that is still on the pro progress, but it will be before we will cope with Koha in May, next May. But during this time, also, the development work in libraries continued. For example, nowadays we don't anymore need these interfaces to online stores. We have another solution. So we made last year a new list. The second list. And we needed also this list to clarify what kind of bigger changes we are forced to do before we go on with Koha. So the second list, the serials. We would like serials would be treated like an books. We like that the individual serial volume numbers need to be reservable in such a way that any item with the same number fill, fill the reservation. Slowness. We were very worried, worried about it because there started to be rumors that Koha is slow, especially information retrievals and also handling the pattern information, but maybe even the loaning. So we needed absolutely the answers. Is this true? Uh, we have several kind of self-service libraries that, um, and we need, we need it that Koha should support all the library, all the self-service library systems that there are available. So, uh, instead of the interfaces to online stores, we need an acquisition interface uh, that support framework agreement. Uh, we are using now this kind of interface service that um, goes like this, that it relates to the online store of providers and the price checking is done by the service. And our purchase 
will automatically well fell on the cheapest price. And that's such a good improvement for the acquisition process that we will never be able to give up this. Um, we were worried about the management system. Is it uh, efficient in enough? Is, uh, is, it, um, is the organization work um, that's run by Kohasomi Limited, is it working good enough? And is it uh, also understandable? Uh, we were very keen on about the com community level that we are having now in our, our library system at this moment. So we would have wanted it also to Koha. Uh, we were also interested in what kind of future plans there is in the cataloging process. We would like the Koha to the checking the bibliographic records for the errors upon their creation and mod modification. Uh, we wanted also that the, know that the usability access and accessibility of the staff client user interface would be very easy to do. And of course, we were interested in the reliability. Will there be database errors, downtime and downs or something like that? But almost everything is done from these two lists. And some points at our second list were there only because we didn't know well enough how things work with Koha. But now we know we have added a lot, lot of our own information. Koha is a quickly developing system. And I especially thank Koha community, the National Library of Finland, and the system developers of Koha Suomi Limited. You all have been doing extremely professional work. Huge improvements have been done. And I feel that my library will safely move to Koha next May. But I have done already a new list. List about things I would like to see in Koha. Like I told you earlier, the amount of the reservation has grown and it will be continue growing. I wish that Koha will have efficient features controlling and handling reservations and hold-ons. Could it perhaps use some sort of machine learning or AI algorithms to control how the reservations get filled and optimize the transport logistics related to that? That would be absolutely wonderful. It would be also extremely wonderful if a single magazine copy would be treated like any other item. Information retrieval is already on the, in the progress, and I hope we will have faster retrievals before next May. We are used to do cooperation in Finland. Almost all Finnish libraries are members of the consortiums. We share pattern information, we share the cataloging information. We have centralized cataloging work inside the consortiums and it's shared between Koha Suomi libraries also. Uh, we have this kind of um, one single central Koha Suomi wide cataloging repository that every library of Koha Suomi uses. At the moment, the records are then transferred from the, our this central, central repository to the consortium level Koha installations. But my wish is that we will be able to do to continue the cooperation and in fact deepen it yet further. With some time, we wish to be in a situation where the records no longer need to be stored locally in, cons locally in consortium level Koha installations at all. 
Instead, we would, we would only have one central bibliography record with repository that is shared by all Koha Suomi libraries. It would be a huge change. I think first we need dreams and then we need just hard work to make them happen. I'm so grateful that you invited me to participate this Kohakon. I'm feeling very honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what a sensational talk. I think following on, having um, your talk, Rebecca, following on from yesterday was just so wonderful for us to see, firstly, the plans and, and what's happening on the ground and, and the technologists behind the work, and then to see that a big part of why that's successful is that the library leadership have taken such an active interest in the technology and its um, pathway into the future. And of course that pathway is known because you have your own technology team working on it. So there's no guesswork as to whether there'll be improvements to Koha. You know there will because you're making them happen. So thank you again so much for that wonderful example to everyone around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce the next talk and the last talk before our morning tea break this morning. Um, we have Lee Rowe and Jacinta Osman joining us, who have been here with us all week in person, and um, they are from the Toi Ohumai Institute of Technology, and I'll tell you briefly about each of them now. Firstly, Jacinta. Uh, Jacinta leads the management of the digital platform at Toi Ohumai Institute of Technology, which is a um, vocational educa education institute based in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Jacinta is passionate about using technology to enhance and enable people's access to information and resources. And I won't tell you too much about um, some of the other things here because I think we're going to talk about them. Jacinta enjoys watching cricket, walking on the beach, pottering in the garden and building large Lego sets with the help of her eight-year-old son. I really love reading these I enjoy things because you just realise how much you have in common with people. <laughs> and for Lee, Lee Rowe. Uh, Lee also works at Toi, Toi Ohome Institute of Technology and the, um, the library migrated to Koha in 2018, which we'll hear about soon. And Lee is the library manager. Um, she likes spending time with her family, cycling, bushwalks, op shopping reading and playing the piano, things I didn't know about Lee. So please join me in welcoming them for their talk. The title of the talk is Data Data Cup of Tea, Success Factors for a Successful Koha Implementation. Thank you. <laughs> We're really pleased to be speaking with you this morning and to be part of such a great conference and the friendly Koha community. So hello to all of you uh, around the world. Jacinta and I work together at Toi Ohumai Institute of Technology, which is in the Bay of Plenty region of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And in July 2018, uh, our library at Toi Ohumai went live with Koha, hosted and supported by Catalyst IT. The project was completed on time and on budget, with our senior managers commenting that this was the smoothest IT project that they'd ever been involved with. <laughs> In this presentation, we'll be sharing with you, from a librarian's perspective, why we think it was successful. And we hope that this will be of interest to any of you who are planning to implement 
kōha, embark on any IT project or, in fact, for planning any complex change. Uh, before we start, I'll just give you some brief background on our organisation to give you the context for our implementation project. So um, Toyo Mai was formed in May 2016, and it was out of the merger of the Bay of Plenty Polytechnic and Wairiki Institute of Technology. The overarching aim of the merger was to better serve the vocational education needs of the wider Bay of Plenty region. The name Toyo Mai represents our vision to aim high and achieve great heights, to be awakened by learning. Toi Ōmai is home to about 12,000 students, 974 staff, and offers a wide range of programs from certificate to postgrad level. There are two campus libraries, 22 library staff, and an extensive collection of physical and online resources. Uh, as a result of the merger, we ended up with two separate library systems. We had Liberty and Voyager. And we also had two different discovery systems. So EDS, uh, EBSCO's EDS and ProQuest Summon. So we needed a single system to take us forward uh, um, to, uh, as a single institution. The time frame for our uh, implementation was only four months. And in that time, we needed to migrate data from two, two different library systems into Koha, integrate the EBSCO um, EDS plugin. Oh, sorry, I've just um, missed a, a little point um, before I go on. Um, so the situation um, the with the, all the different systems, gave us the opportunity to explore the, explore the whole library systems environment and um, to find a solution to best fit the needs of Toi Oho Mai. We ended up choosing Koha, coupled with EBSCO's EDS Koha plugin, as the best fit for Toi Oho Mai and its community. So yeah, the time frame for our implementation was um, only four months. And in that time, we needed to migrate data from the two systems into Koha, integrate the plugin, implement single sign on, integrate with our student management system, configure our specific requirements, and carry out testing and training. And on top of that, because of the merger, there was a lot of associated change happening. Um, we needed to align our circulation um, policies and our collection policies and also support our staff who were getting used to uh, working in the new environment, new, new culture, um, and um, being in, in new, new or changed roles. So for us, um, it was a, a complex change process. And in preparing for this presentation today, we came across um, the NOSTA model for managing complex change, which describes five elements for effective change. And in considering this model, we realised that our project had had a good balance across all those five elements. And we think that's why um, the, the project, we had such a good outcome. The five elements are vision, skills, incentive, incentives, resources, and an action plan. And this is a visual representation of the NOSTA model, which some of you may be familiar with. So on the, um, the top right, oh sorry, on the top um, row, we have the five elements, vision, skills, incentives, resources, and an action plan. And if we have all of those in place, um, we're going to have success. And if we're missing any of the elements, um, we will, um, might end up with some of the um, results or outcomes on the, that are on the right-hand right column in the purple. So, for example, if we're missing an action plan, um, that's the, the grey bit in the blue column, we may have false starts. If we're missing resources, that's the grey bit in the resources column, 
we may end up with frustration. And if we're missing incentives, uh, that's in the, that middle column, I don't know what colour that is, sort of a khaki colour, we're missing, uh, we will, might end up with resistance. And if we're missing skills, we may end up with anxiety. And lastly, if we're missing vision, there may be confusion. Well, there's yeah, highly likely to be confusion. So we're now going to look at each of those elements um, a little more and discuss how they contributed to our successful project. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about vision and then I'll pass you over to Jacinta for um, the other four elements. So the first element uh, is vision and having a strong vision is really important for managing complex change successfully as it provides clarity and guidance and without this confusion may reign. And before we began our um, search for a new library system, we spent a lot of time thinking about Toi Ohomai's vision and how that could be embodied in a, in a new library system. Um, and the student experience was at, at the heart of this. Um, and our vision is to, to see um, this in the picture, this happening, our students graduating, being proud and going on to serve their communities. Um, and from this thinking, we developed a set of objectives for the project. These are also incorporated core library principles around the accessibility of knowledge, the open sharing of resources, and the respect for the rights and privacy of people and their data. Um, these objectives informed our tendering process, and we evaluated responses from suppliers based on these. And students were involved in this process, attending vendor demonstrations and providing feedback from a student perspective. Uh, using these objectives and the evaluation, we decided that Koha was the best fit for our organisation. So the focus and time that we put in at the start to clearly identify our vision and objectives not only helped with choosing the best system, but help to guide the implementation of the project throughout. And the, yeah, the objectives helped because they were really clear to us um, and they also helped us with making difficult decisions uh, as we could refer back to them to help us decide. And at the same time, um, this work helped develop the emerging culture of our team. Having a clear vision that we could share with the team helped us navigate through the ups and downs of the merger process. Now I'm going to hand over to Jacinta to talk about the next four elements of planning a successful change. Kia ora tato. Uh, the next element in NOSTA's model is incentives, and this is all about motivation for change. We needed strong incentives to introduce a new library system which would substantially change many of the processes that our library staff were used to. People need a reason to get behind a change, and we had some good ones. A major incentive was that our, one of our legacy library systems was very outdated and holding us back from providing the library services that we wanted to. A new library system would pr allow us to manage our electronic resources more easily and it would have a user interface that was from the 21st century rather than the 1990s. We wanted to provide a better student experience. Throughout the project, our library continued to use our two existing library systems, which meant duplicating work on both systems. Our library staff were spending a lot of time on this duplication, and so having just the one system was definitely a big incentive for us. We would also save money by having just the one system, which was an important factor for getting support for the project from senior management. We were excited about moving to a system that used open source code. Yay! 
The flexibility that open source provides is a refreshing change after years of using proprietary library systems from global companies where the needs of a relatively small academic library in New Zealand were always overlooked in favour of the needs of large American libraries. We wanted a library system that would reflect Aotearoa New Zealand, and in particular one that embraced Te Reo Māori seamlessly. Koha's Te Reo interface gave us a great opportunity to do this. And as a project team, we took time to acknowledge each other's successes and celebrate each milestone of the project. These moments were important because they reassured us that we were doing well and making progress on what at times seemed to be an enormous project. So resources are another key factor in NOSTA's model. In this case, it's about having the time, money, staff and equipment to carry out the change. For us, the merger workstream had identified the need for a single library system, and there was an allocated budget for this, so we had the financial support to run a successful project. Having great relationships had really helped in the success of this implementation. For example, having a good relationship with our in-house IT team helped us to overcome any tricky issues during the project. An informal relationship with Catalyst IT had been built up from chatting at various library conferences and events over a number of years. And Catalyst already provided support for Toi Ohomai with Moodle, Mahara and Drupal. So by choosing Koha, we were building on an already meaningful and effective partnership. We were lucky enough to work with a project manager and we found her support priceless. All of us on the project team were expected to carry on our normal jobs, of course, as well as working on the implementation. And having a project manager to focus on the admin side of the project was fantastic. Our project manager, Tess, set up any meetings we had, wrote reports on our progress, and gently reminded us of forgotten tasks. Throughout the project, we were overseen by a governance team made up of three people from senior management. We reported weekly to them on our progress and outlined any issues or risks that we had identified. This gave comfort to senior management that we were on track and in return, we knew that we had their support throughout the project. Finally, there were two major resources for our project that weren't allowed, outlined in any of our reports, but that were essential to the success of the project. Caffeine and snacks. So lots of cups of tea and coffee and home baking were consumed in meetings, user testing and celebrating the outcome. We highly recommend copious amounts of both to ensure a successful project. So for any successful change project, you need to make sure that everyone involved has the necessary skills to carry the project through to completion. We found it vital to have someone who knew the metadata in our existing library systems inside and out, for example, a cataloger familiar with Mark. Knowing how your data is structured in your current system will help you to ensure that the right information is mapped across to the right places in Koha. It also helps to run some checks on your metadata before you start the project because there might be clean up jobs that need to be done before you migrate the data across. Choose a project team that has a mix of thinking styles and skills. You need someone who can think strategically, who can see the bigger picture and look at what's best for your customers and the institution, not just what works for library staff. You also need someone who's good with the details and who's going to notice when small but important things are slipping through the cracks. As most countries have learned in 2020 with the global pandemic, listen to the experts. Explain what you want and then, and this is the kicker, trust the advice they give you. This is where it really helps to have built a solid relationship 
with your IT team or your vendor that is assisting with the installation. Most importantly, a sense of humour and empathy within the project team helps to smooth the tricky moments and make it an enjoyable and satisfying project. We were lucky enough to have all of these skills covered in our project team. And uh, just before you go on, Jacinta, in the interest of accessibility, the picture here on the screen shows one of our um, carpentry students with, I think it's a nail, nail gun. Nail gun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> build, build, building one of our, um, building a house that we um, then go on and, and sell in the community. So, action plan. You can have all the vision, incentives, resources and skills in the world, but you won't get anywhere without a detailed action plan. It needs to clearly outline what needs to be done and when it needs to be done by. No one on our project team had any previous experience of merging two library systems into one, so we took a lot of guidance from Catalyst, who had ample experience in this area. Again, it was a case of trust the experts in deciding what needed to be done. As the project team were expected to carry on business as usual, as well as work on the project, we found that using systems helped to keep us on track. We used a relatively simple spreadsheet register that recorded tasks to be done, decisions made, and any risks or issues that needed to be reported to our governance team. We considered using specific project management software, but as none of us had ever used such software before, we thought it would be simpler to just stick to a spreadsheet, and it worked fine. We were working to a fairly tight time frame of needing to merge the two systems and launch Koha within four months, so sticking to the deadlines was crucial. This is where our project manager really helped. At our weekly meeting, review meetings, she would metaphorically give us a kick up the butt if we'd missed a deadline. Doing lots of testing was crucial to a successful launch of Koha to our staff and students. We wrote and used a testing plan that was so effective that we still use it today for testing any major updates installed on Koha. We also asked students and academic staff to be involved with the testing and, the, and they provided feedback on the user interface, particularly around the usability and navigation of the OPAC site. We then made tweaks to the interface based on their suggestions. One vital part of our action plan was staff training. It was easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day busyness of getting everything ready for launch, but a key part in the success of the project relied on training our library team so that they felt as comfortable as possible using Koha from day one. This also meant that our library staff were able to help staff and academic student, um, students and academic staff to learn how to use Koha after it was launched. And yes, we've got a photo there of our students looking at how to build a house, I suspect, or a construction site. So that covers off our five elements of NOSTA's model and how they were reflected in our project. I'm now going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and the successes we had. So looking back at the project, um, we identified some, some big challenges and successes. The biggest challenge of the project was managing scope creep. This is where the original scope of the project gets bigger and bigger and bigger after the project begins as people come up with new deliverables and ideas to be added in. Throughout the project we came up with lots of ideas for additional features that we could implement. It was tempting to add these to our project, but we always reviewed these ideas in relation to the time frame, the budget and the staff resources that we had. Some of these ideas were assigned to phase two, which kept us focused on phase one. In other words, what we needed to achieve to be ready for launch. Another challenge was the data integration phase of the project. The data in one of our systems was not in pure MARC format, and so for librarians out there, you know how challenging that can be sometimes. 
It needed a lot of tidying up and tweaking to enable smooth mapping across to Koha. What was our biggest success? We believe that the relationships we had built with students, academic staff, our in-house high tea team and Catalyst were the most important factor for the success of our project. Taking advantage of these relationships meant that we had input from all of our stakeholders, especially and most importantly from our students. As Lee has already mentioned, a positive student experience is at the heart of everything we do, and this project was never going to be a success unless it met the needs of our students. I'll now pass things back to Lee to sum up. So yes, just in summary, um, we're, we're very proud that our Koha implementation was on budget on, on deadline. Uh, we are also proud that two years on from launch, we have a world-class culturally responsive system and students and staff enjoy using Koha and picked up how to use it really quickly and easily. Uh, although we didn't know about the NOSTA model uh, before we began our project, in re retrospect, our planning included all of the five elements um, of the model for, yeah, to, that led to effective change. The cups of tea and um, the relationships were just as important as having the data skills in a project budget. In fact, I'd say the cups of tea and the relationships were the most satisfying and rewarding part of, of the, the project. We won't say that the project was completely without any challenges. There were many. But by having all of these elements covered in great relationships, we were able to work through any issues without too much difficulty. Um, and uh, as I said before, this model can be applied to any project or change process, regardless of the goal or whether it's IT related or not. Uh, so just to finish off, what's next for us? Uh, we'd love to collaborate more with other libraries using Koha. Uh, we've started working with Wintech. H hello to colleagues at Wintech, if you're watching, who they've also implemented Koha recently. And one thing we'd like to do is conduct, conduct research on um, how the Te Reo Māori interface is being used by students and the impact it's having. Uh, and also um, a big thing that's happening for us at the moment is the vocational education sector in Aotearoa, New Zealand is currently undergoing a major transformation. With all of the institutes of technology and politics, that's 16 of them, and all of the industry training organisations being brought under the uh, one umbrella of um, Te Pukenga, the New Zealand Institute of Skills and Technology. Um, Te Pukenga has been created to provide more sustainable, flexible and accessible learning for our students. The government expects the staff of Te Pukenga to embed equity for Māori learners in its culture, delivery and outcomes. And when the time is right, we would love to see Koha being adopted across the whole new institution. <laughs> Fingers crossed, <laughs> as we can see that it's a solution that would be a, a perfect fit for Te Pukinga's vision. And just before we go, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge all of our toy or my colleagues back at home. Hi everyone. Um, the seriously amazing Koha team at Catalyst and all of you in the Koha global community. Uh, and thank you for sharing your expertise in many different ways and for your support and kindness. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Yeah, from behind is awesome. Um, thank you so much, Lee and Jacinta. Um, we've, well, we all at Catalyst, of course, love working with you, but we thank you so much for sharing 
everything um, you just have with us all here today. So I'll just be a small moment here. <laughs> Awesome. So for uh, you, Jacinta. Thank you very much. And this one. Lovely. And for Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you very yes, much, thank you. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Uh, for we're now breaking for morning tea here in Wellington. Um, it's I think we'll come back maybe just five minutes late, so um, expect us just five minutes past the hour if you're online, and we'll um, be back with you soon. Thanks so much.
Kia ora noa. Uh, welcome back, and we are here for the um, next two, or is it three, presentations of the day. We will soon find out. Uh, I would like to just introduce the first one, and then after that one, I'll count the other, the other two. It'll take me, I've got 20 minutes to do that, so that's good. Um, Ian Beardsley. Um, Ian is the Catalyst Open Source Academy Coordinator, at, and you're going to hear more today about what that means and what that is. Uh, Ian has been at Catalyst for just under 15 years, cursing at computers in different roles over that time. Although at times he regrets not having trained in professional macrame, he does usually enjoy working with people and computers. In his spare time, he likes hurting himself while not skiing, not getting hit by people, and alternating between watching the veggie garden grow and ripping the weeds that weren't actually veggies out. <laughs> Look forward to hearing your talk, Ian, and I'll hand over to him now. Thanks so much. So um, this will either be 11 slides done in 2 minutes and 36 seconds, or at about two o'clock on slide three, I'll be tied to, <laughs> I'll be tied, told to quieten down. Um, so, I um, had wanted to do this a number of years, um, mainly because it would be nice to be able to go and do this in other places. Um, unfortunately, I'm here in Wellington, um, and most of the people that I'd like to have spoken to a little bit more in person aren't actually here, but. Um, I hope everyone is well. Um, it is works. Excellent. Um, so just to clarify some of the um, comments, um, I have been skiing. I quite enjoy skiing, but um, a couple of times in the car park afterwards and putting my ski boots on, I've managed to hurt myself relatively badly. One ended up in surgery. Um, as yet, I haven't hurt myself actually skiing. <laughs> touch wood. Um, that picture is actually um, in Japan um, when um, we got back just before the COVID lockdown, which was handy. Um, up in the corner, um, the not, get, not getting hurt by people or not hitting people. Um, I do um, teach a martial arts club um, and that's my belt, nice and old and tattered. Um, and I have a picture of my garden. I don't have many pictures in my slides because basically um, it's too hard to choose which ones. So Open Source Academy. Um, our Open Source Academy is a thing that we've done that is about teaching students open source development processes and roles. It is two weeks in January, mainly because in Wellington we have two full weeks that aren't caught by public holidays in school holiday time. We've been running it since 2011. We have each class, we have about 20 students. Um, depending on who you talk to is how many is our optimal number. Our first academy, we um, thought, well, our training room has 10 10 laptops in it, so let's just aim for 10. We had 16 people. We thought, okay, let's bump that up a bit because, you know, we can probably do that. Um, the next one we had 22. Uh, so we're sort of sitting around that 20, 20, 20 students mark. Um, it's a nice balance between being able to get people around and get people with a hands-on thing. Uh, we aim for the year 11 to 13 students. Um, we don't do university students because that's what university's for. Um, and the senior secondary school students are the ones that have probably done a little bit of digital technology and will be in a position where they're going to be able to gain a little bit more from we, what we can offer them. Um, some people have said, why don't you do code schools for primary schools? But, yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder when you start talking to people that are substantially younger than you or you don't have a lot of experience dealing with small things. <laughs> uh, we have been lucky that um, one of the um, schools that has been involved 
as a girls' school. Um, so a lot of promotion, promotion by the Wellington East girls has meant that our class numbers have been 50-50 male-female. Um, it's probably fair to note that it's probably we should be thinking about our diversity rather than gender balance. Um, the academy started because we were looking at where our future employees would come from at Catalyst and also the realisation that technology, IT, seems to be pimply-faced male coming through. Um, so we want to be able to ensure that as we grow through, as we grow up, bring those students through. Um, digital technology is a diverse thing. If I look around this room, um, it's probably even 50-50 male, female, which is a good thing. Um, but also have to consider that, you know, librarians often tend to be female. The people in the back room doing the technology often depend, seem to be male, but we want to change that. So basically our two weeks is a tutorial week and a project week. Oh, yep, cool. I have a plan. I remember my plan. Look, there's a slide there that tells me what my plan is. Um, so we also run a Arduino Academy. So this is three, three days in the, July, in the July school holidays. We've been running it since 2013. Uh, once again, year 11 to 13 students, um, eight of them, because that's how many we can stuff into our training room. It's three days, basically. We teach them basic electronics, uh, basic Arduino, and they have a project they work on. Um, sometimes that is just... What can they do with all the components they've got? Um, sometimes we've been able to get them to follow along and actually work on a temperature sensor and being able to put it to a website. Excuse me. Yes, so, um, yeah, the Arduino Academy is something that has happened and we've quite enjoyed doing that as well. So, some statistics... Jeez. Some statistics... <laughs> Thank you, just laugh along. Um, we've had 190 students come through our Open Source Academy over the years. Um, we've been averaging about 20 per student, per 20, 20 per academy. Um, 14 of those have had paid work at Catalyst. Um, they've all gone off to do other things. Um, five have had full-time roles. Um, just because they've had a full-time role doesn't mean they're still currently employed. We have three currently employed full-time at Catalyst. Um, and we have one doing part-time work. And sometimes, you know, part-time work um, at Catalyst will often lead into full-time work. Hey, Alicia. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, it'd be nice if we have to have more come through Catalyst, but people go off and do different things. Um, some students have gone off to work in the US at Salesforce, and we've had people, you know, Datacom and all sorts of other places um, that aren't Catalyst, but, you know, we can't all be perfect. <laughs> so our tutorial week. Um, it's, we use developing an application, a, a small application, to be able to teach the students about the development process and about using the tools. Um, we see those things on there. Um, you may guess that that's a lot to jam into a week, um, and it is. It is a lot. That's why tutorial week is actually also Monday on the second week. Um, so students start off by installing Ubuntu onto their laptop, or our laptop that we're giving them to use for the week. We've had a number of students come through that already know about um, Linux, um, have played with servers and stuff like that. <coughs> it's important to note, I think, for us that we don't want students who know everything. Uh, we want to be able to develop those who have a keen interest, but not necessarily have the opportunity to be able to do, to learn about technology or, or do some of these things themselves. We have a server on our Catalyst Cloud that they get to lock down um, and secure and then use for the, the, the ongoing course. Um, freedom, um, I'm just talking about that's Don Christie, one of our, our managing director, does an excellent presentation 
Um, if you've been at a previous Kohakon in Wellington, for example, you probably would have seen it. Um, he's probably got it on the web somewhere. Um, it's well worth watching. It's talking about why open source is important. And um, we also have a one have a presentation in with that section about not being a jerk. <laughs> knowing how to talk <laughs> knowing how to talk to people and work with people is an important part of most most any job. Um, and understanding that where people are coming from, um, the way the the way they talk, the way they may write something, um, doesn't necessarily mean they're a blithering idiot. Um, it often means that they actually have English as a second language um, or that they're shy or that they're overly exuberant. Um, how the web works, um, understanding why a computer talks or how a computer talks to the web is important. Understanding that, you know, when you're all the little ones and zeros as they disappearing across the ether are actually doing smart and intelligent things. So, and I'm just going to go to, cross on to the next slide, next part of that, programming principles as well. Um, so those parts are sort of some of the foundation of being able to start doing the work, understanding that, you know, how ifs and whiles work. Most students as they come in through the academy now know that, um, but often we find that some students don't have as much experience to go on as they can, as we, we would like them to be able to. So we have that in there to make sure we're building that foundation. Um, and then we get into like the user experience and requirements analysis. So people come into the Open Source Academy think, oh yes, I'm going to do lots of programming, I'm going to make all these fantastic games. And actually um, sitting down and with a pen and paper or a whiteboard, uh, being able to work out what you're going to do and how you're going to get there is just as important than sitting down and banging away at a keyboard to make things happen. Understanding how the HTML, CSS and JavaScript worked. Um, we've got a full week. Um, in previous academies, we've been able to shuffle things around and had Julius along to be able to um, do some accessibility. Um, it's always hard to be able to work out how we can jam all the stuff in. Um, database work, PHP, Python, ReactJS, um, to be able to create a database for their application, have PHP to build a, programmatically build the HTML and CSS, um, and then we have Python to create the API that talks to the database, and then the ReactJS then goes talks to that Python API. So we're using a whole bunch of things to be able to build into what we're doing with that, with that tutorial week. It is a lot. Um, Half-day sessions uh, where we're trying to teach several weeks of high school or university level type PHP. It's fun. Um, and I suppose the important thing to think about that, it's not one person standing up and telling people how to do stuff. Um, at Catalyst, one of the beautiful things about our Open Source Academy is we have people who are working with these tools all day, every day, usually. Um, and they're the people that are teaching the students or working with the students. We've got one person who's the key tutor and we've got two or three people running around the classroom helping the students with the problems. It's not a lecturer just talking at it. It is people helping people get the things done. Project Week. So the Project Week, the Open Source Academy, the way I like to think it, the end goal is to be able to have a student get a patch or some sort of change done into a real open source project. Not a little make-believe project like we've done in our tutorial week, but be able to work with um, people around the world to be able to build or make some changes to a an open source project. Some people have got been able to just get a small change into some documentation. But the process is similar to making a change to the code. You need to be able to talk to people. You need to be able to accept that maybe what you did wasn't quite right. You need to be able to accept that feedback. You need to be able to give feedback to other people as well. So previous projects we've used, um, Drupal, Mahara, Moodle, OpenStack, Pewik, which are now Matomo, 
um, and Silverstripe. Um, we've all had those projects being able to um, work with our students and get some, get some code into the upstream projects. It's always been impressive to see the different, our team and occasionally people from outside Catalyst give those students a hand. But why am I doing this here at Kōhākon? Well, Kōhā has, the project has been a fantastic thing, thing for our Open Source Academy. Um, it was there for the first year um, and all through the rest of the academies. Um, it has been part of what we're doing with our students. It has helped fantastically by the fact that we have a bunch of very keen developers at Catalyst working on the Core Hub project. Um, and the fact that the community itself it's, is a big community that does a lot of work helping people. Um, the first changes were a bunch of unit tests. Um, if we go back to... Can I go back? Yes. Uh, there's no pearl in there. The first couple ones we did pearl, but um, people said that was mean and nasty to school children. <laughs> Not the words, but let's just go with those. Um, so we've had 54 students through the academy uh, working on the Koha project. Um, hundreds of kittens have been saved. Um, Tosca's looking at quite well. <laughs> um, scoreboard.kohacommunity.org um, is a scoreboard of what the students have done. Um, feel free to have a look at it now while I'm talking. But basically it's a way of helping set goals um, so students know that they've been able to do what they've done, um, whether they've QA'd a patch, had a patch rejected, fixed a patch. Um, yeah. Um, and you can find a little bit more about... Um, so, sorry. The community, part of the community... The reason I like this is, is the community um, has... The Catalyst Academy, they've selected bugs which are suitable for students to be able to work on. The fact that we have people in Germany or the US giving students feedback overnight once they've submitted patches or made some changes, tried to make some changes. That's, that's the beautiful thing about being able to work in Koha is that it's not just your local team, your local organisation. There's a big community that is very willing to help people achieve things. They want to achieve things because they're wanting to achieve things themselves, but helping people do that is a very, um, a very good thing. The future. We skipped 2020, the beginning of this year. It wasn't because of COVID. Uh, it was basically um, workload was big and solid, um, and so by the time we started getting advertising underway for the recruitment, um, it was almost school holidays and then students were not overly focused. We ended up with eight applications, which um, wasn't quite enough to be able to make it go ahead. Speaking of applications, I think the biggest one we had, biggest year we had was 42 applications for the 20 people. Um, unfortunately, a bunch of those self-selected out by not replying to emails. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Anyway, so going ahead. Um, online learning, remote learning. Um, both of those are difficult. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the good things about our Open Source Academy is we have hands-on people helping people. Um, once we start trying to do that remotely, um, online, it becomes a little bit harder and will change the way change what makes the Open Source Academy as good as it is. But, you know, that doesn't say we can't do it. It'd just be a different way of doing it. Um, road trips. I had a little bit of a discussion while we're having morning tea. Um, there's no reason why I don't think we can be picking this up, the Academy up, and taking it to other places. We can take it to Marais around the country. We could take it to libraries. We could take it to just schools and out-of-the-way places. Although, of course, remembering that we are aiming for um, secondary school students um, and often 
secondary school students do have, or secondary schools do have, some sort of digital technology. But also at the same time, we have to remember that often digital technology teachers are the maths teachers that have all of a sudden had to learn how to use computers. Um, we'd like to be able to think about how we can do a Raspberry Pi Academy. Sorry, just looking at my time to make sure I'm not going to go over too much. Um, and the idea of maybe how we could do a Kohar Academy. Now this is where we maybe be able to look at how things can be done online. The idea of we have a, some structured learning that can take someone who is interested in learning about Kohar development and teach them about how Linux works so they know how to run their server, teach them about Perl, teach them about the Python that's needed, teach them about accessibility and making sure that stuff's built into their code as they're doing their development. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the future. We've got so many things we could do um, that always, it's always going to come down to you know, time, effort, um, money, unfortunately. So, yeah. Um, anyway, um, so that was my um, quick discussion about the Open Source Academy. Uh, what the? <laughs> Which sort of reminds me about when I sent my CV off. Um, I'd done it in Star Office. Um, which at the time was the precursor to OpenOffice, which is the precursor to LibreOffice. Um, and I'd done it in that and then exported it as a PDF and sent it off. And um, the recruiter said, um, why did you send it like a ransom note? <laughs> all the fonts got all mangled up. And so, you know, it was like big fonts and little fonts. And it's like, oh. Anyway, um, so that should read ian at catalyst.net.nz for my email. Twitter account, iBeardsley. Um, or Catalyst Academy. Um, the I Beardsley one is my personal one. You may get bits of garden, bits of weird ranting, talking about politics and horrible things like that. Um, we've got catalyst.net.nz not it. Catalyst.net.nz slash academy. Um, and LinkedIn for me is um, LinkedIn I Beardsley. Um, before I finish, I have one more thing. One of the things I had wanted, um, the reason I would have liked to have done this in other places and with more people around, is I would like to have been able to thank a lot more people, personally, for what they've been able to do. So um, I'm sort of going to do this now. Um, we're going to do it in a non-physical way. Can I get everyone to stand up for me? Can I just get you to put your right arm up? And your left arm up? Oh. Yeah. Reach round, a little bit of a squeeze, and thank you very much for all the work you've done. <laughs> that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, we have had lots of conversations about how um, all the different things the Academy can do for Koha and we can we can do for the Academy. Um, we've even floated the idea of a Librarian Academy. I'm floating it again now. Um, so thank you for all of the work you've done to um, share what we know with so many others. Ian. Thank you very much. You're there are two more talks. <laughs> uh, the next one is by Lisette Shear and it is a lightning talk. Um, Lizette works for the Leitar County District, the, the Leitar County Library District, as a system administrative specialist. She's also the current president of the Koha US Users Group, which is a very um, large and well-attended group. During her free time, Lizette enjoys puzzles, games, spending time with her partner and her cat. Um, so the talk is Life Since Portland Kohakon 2018, and um, we're looking forward to hear what Koha US are up to. Thank you, Lizette. Hello all, I'm Lizette Shear, the current president of the Koha US Users Group. 
wanted to update you all on what we've been up to since we last saw you in Portland for KohaCon 2018. The first thing I wanted to talk to you about today was our user groups. All our user groups get access to Google Groups for messaging, access to the Zoom meeting, and publicity on our website. We currently have two types of interest groups. We currently have two types of users groups. First, special interest groups. We have seven special interest groups, including acquisitions, cataloging, consortia, demonstration, system administration, user services, and web development. Each of these special interest groups meets regularly, and the meetings are designed to welcome people who want to talk about different aspects of Koha. They're very popular, and you don't have to be a member, or even in the U.S., to join. We also have one leisure special interest group, Book and Crafting Club, who meet one day a month after hours to discuss a book while they craft, or not craft if you don't want to. We have also opened up to regional interest groups, where if there are many libraries in a state or area, such as North Texas, they can set up a Google group and post on their website, as well as use our Zoom room for meetings should they desire. We also list already established regional user groups on this page, such as the Kansas Koha Regional User Group. We've had three conferences since the Portland Conference in 2018. Last September in 2019, we had our annual fall conference in Pueblo, Colorado, and our theme was Patron Power, Enable Your Users. We had 70 people register for the conference. Here is a picture of all of us outside the public library. In the spring of 2020, we had our first ever Kohathon, an online conference that we had been planning on doing for a couple of years. We didn't ask people to register, but on the day of our conference, our live streams on YouTube had over 1180 views, so we count it as a success. In the fall of 2020, we had another conference, the Online Together Conference. We had over 250 registrants and a lot of great presentations. The first day, two days were conferences, and for the third day we did our first ever Bugapalooza. We started the day with a sandboxes webinar, and then every half hour we did uh, like focused bug talks. So we started with acquisitions talks, and we had bugs prepared from our general meetings as well as our acquisition user group meetings. And we talked about those and encouraged people to come and talk about acquisitions related bugs during that time. We had different sections for each of our different interest groups. And it was quite a success. Another thing I want to talk to you about today is membership. Our membership has grown from 32 paid members in 2018, the same year as the Portland Conference, to this year we're up to 82 paid members. We've also had a lot of growth in the community engagement, especially with the special interest groups. We've got even more going on. We also got our own Zoom account instead of using a member Zoom account, which allowed us the ability to do more with those special and regional user groups. We also have a demo instance set up at demo.coha-us.org, thanks to Bywater Solutions. And we have a Threadless shop with some sweet Koha US merch. Available at Koha US, all one word, dot threadless dot com. Since Portland, our Koha edu our education committee, oh, really overhauled the Learn From Us page on the website. Up at the top here, we have our links to different sections of the website, followed by a quick reference guide, which were made by members of the Koha US Education Committee and we're working on some more, including one for template toolkit and notices. Below this, we've got different sections, such as how to set up Koha, how to customize Koha, and how to use Koha. Some of these link to specific pages on our website that we've created for this purpose, which link out to different Koha resources on the web. Some of them just link specifically to resources on the web or to the manual, depending on what we've got. We've also got links to the manual and links to join the user groups if there's a relevant user group for that particular page. 
We also have videos listed of different videos available. We are planning on adding more of the presentation videos from various conferences to these pages. Beneath the modules section, we also have links to our new features of our Koha US original training videos and our links to the Koha International Community uh, options such as the IRC, mailing lists, Bugzilla, and down at the bottom here we have links to all of our past conferences. So what's next for Koha US? We've got elections upcoming later this year in November for some of our board members, board positions. We're also moving forward on our first development and updating the development process so it can go smoother and be more clear for both our members and the development committee. We're also planning Cohothon 2021 for next spring for dates and more information on that. Our annual conference was going to be in McKinney this year, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to switch to the online format. Next year, we're planning on running it running the conference in McKinney, September 20th to 23rd, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for attending this presentation. I've put links to Coas US social media. You can contact me through at president at coha-us.org through the end of the year. You can find our website at coha-us.org. You can find us on Twitter at Koha US, all one word on YouTube at youtube.com slash kohaus, on Threadless at threadless.kohaus.threadless.com, and I'm in the IRC as Lizette Leita. I should be joining you shortly for a live Q&A. Thanks, everyone. waiting for the stream and I'm on <laughs> thank you so much Lisette for your talk um, we made the decision not to do the live Q&A and sorry you didn't know that before you made your presentation and sent it to us um, but we decided to simplify our lives a tiny bit by doing that um, awesome Koha US you're doing such a wonderful job and I think everyone in the room will be excited to look up all the different resources you've been putting together and keep an eye on what your conferences have been achieving. Very, very cool. Um, next up, and excuse me for a moment while I grab my notes. Um, next up, we have one last talk before lunch, and it is from Fred King, um, who many will know as, well, whenever you hear Fred King, you hear the words, avenging chicken. Um, and so I will read his bio and um, you'll see, I'm sure the chicken will make an appearance. So. Um, for the benefit of anyone who um, is not visual, you'll be um, hearing some laughter and can be rest assured that there is a rubber chicken in the photo. <laughs> so about Fred King. Fred received his MSLS from the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC in the waning years of the previous century. He has had an awful lot of jobs since then, and for the past 15 years, he's been a medical librarian at MedStar Washington Hospital, just down the street from the Catholic University. He was introduced to Koha around 2012, and in 2013, he migrated his library to Koha 3.12. He also developed the MedStar Authors Catalogue using a slightly modified version of Koha, and um, he served as one of the founding board members of Koha US. First as a member at large, and then member at large slash unsupported. He didn't do anything in this position, he says, but he did it very well. <laughs> so his experience migrating a small library convinced him that Koha could be a cost-effective way for other libraries to automate. And so I'm going to leave the content of its talk to speak for itself. And um, Fred, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing it.
submitted for your approval. A computer chip the size of my fingernail. On it is an entire operating system and integrated library system. All of this runs on a computer that costs less than $100 and is the size of a deck of playing cards. Are we in a library or have we entered the twilight zone? Craft erasion. Right, start over. Pat, pat, pat. Bugger. Well, so much for a dramatic entrance. Let's start again. Wish I could be in New Zealand. I hope you're all having fun. I wish I could be anywhere except my basement. Um, green screen. Also, working in my basement for the last seven months is probably what's made my asthma so bad, so it sounds like I'm about to die. Um, I'm not quite dead, so let's get on with it. So, as the name implies, I am Fred King. I'm a medical librarian at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. And this is my traveling companion, the Avenging Chicken. Actually, we're at home right now, so I think we can take our masks off. That's what we look like. And my presentation is called, Got $100? Get an ILS. Uh, before I continue, I should probably point out that although I am using MedStar Health official brand, uh, any opinions I express are only mine, um, not necessarily represent my employer or any of my colleagues. So this pr presentation will show you how to use COA a Raspberry Pi, Mark Edit, and a chicken, chicken's optional, to create a fully functional ILS. Some of this may look a bit familiar. Um, this is an update of the presentation I gave last year, back in the days when we could travel to places. And I also recycling some material I gave at Koa US um, last month. And yes, some of the jokes are recycled too. Picture the cat's new, same cat. There's the cat. We always need a cat photo. So why a Raspberry Pi? Well, it's an incredibly complex computing platform, as you can see by the technical manual over on the right. And the latest version is approaching a desktop and computing power. In fact, might be that this already has the computer power of this, which is a PDP-11. They're readily available. Basic model costs $35. A lot of Raspberry Pi projects around, why not an ILS? And I wanted to see if it was possible. Start out, well, I starting with a Raspberry Pi 4B with four gigabytes of RAM. Um, the largest one has eight gig RAM now, but that would have broken my budget. Uh, it also has wireless and Bluetooth and a few other goodies. Um, have a 32 gig class 10 micro card. The official Raspberry Pi case, and the chicken seems to have gotten tangled up in the official Raspberry Pi power supply. And if you're wondering what those blurry round things are, they're US quarters, just to give you an idea of the size. If you can persuade the librarian of the lake to uh, hold forth a barcode scanner designating that you are the one true cataloger, uh, that's a good thing to have, too. It's not in the budget, but it will save you a lot of typing. And here I'm going to admit the cheating a little bit. 
because anyone who takes this on is going to have a drawer full of things, including write cables, keyboard, etc. You probably have a monitor with HDMI and a network connection and another computer. Another computer is necessary only to um, create the SD card with the operating system, but I used it for a few other things. I should also mention that the SD cards are small, and if you have a dog that thinks anything that falls on the floor is hers, um, well, fortunately, they're small enough that you don't have to try to find it though my budget does not include replacements for the card. That is. Steps, install the operating system, install and configure COA, obtain a list of ISBNs, use MarkEdit and Z3950 to harvest Mark records, edit the records, upload them to COA, then add the items. Install the operating system comes first, as you might think. Uh, www.raspberrypi.org has a lot of good background information. Last year, there was not an Ubuntu image for Raspberry Pi. There is now. I downloaded the 64-bit. Ubuntu also has a tutorial on how to install Ubuntu on your Raspberry Pi, which is very helpful. You download it. it, comes in an XZ file. You extract that with 7-zip from 7-zip.org. And as you can see in the lower right, the original XZ file is 692 megabytes and it expanded to a bit over three gigabytes. And download Win32 Disk Imager. Create the image, and there you are. For the command line installation, I'm using the directions from the Koa Community Wiki, uh, Koa on Ubuntu Packages. Okay, so operating system's installed. So we log in, First you have to change your password. Changing myself to a super user. By the way, I've speeded this up just so I can fit in my t allotted time. Okay, echo, deb. What you have to include is arch386, i386, in brackets. Otherwise, you won't know what you're looking for. Then you update, upgrade, yes. Time for a cup of tea. It's going to take a while. Then install Koa Common. Yeah, this is also going to take a while. There's enough for two cups of tea in that pot. And Mariah DB server, except it won't take it, but it tells you what it doesn't have. Mariah DB server 10.3, which depends on Mariah DB client 10.3. So you just go back and install them. Someone more clever than I can, can reconfigure the packages. But for now, that's what you have to do. Just said this is double time, so it's taking... It's going pretty speedy, speedily. Then you have to fiddle with Apache. Now you create the instance, which I'm calling library. 
bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? You have to make a few tweaks. Go in and make sure that it's listening on port 8080 for the staff interface. More stuff with Apache. This one's already enabled. So is this one. So restart Apache anyway. Now that is what you need to log in to COA. The thing ending with the at sign. If you can copy it and paste it into something, so much the better. But that is all there is to setting up COA with the command line. Now let's go over to the GUI. Okay, now we've gone over to the IP address colon 8080 or the domain name plus colon 8080. And we can finish the setup from here. First of all, we put in your username, which is COA, and then instance name, in this case, library. I managed to copy the password. A lot of this is just clicking on the blue button, waiting for the next step. Database settings, okay. Now you set up the database. I choose Mark 21 because that's what everyone uses around here. And I'm adding a few of the optional things like matching rules for Mark 21. I'm skipping all the uh, suggested patron types. I'm adding some Z3950 servers. Fault data are loaded. Click here to continue. Now you create a library. I'm calling it LIB. Full name is library. You can go back and change this later. You need a patron category for administrator. I'm calling it staff. And it won't expire for 999 months. Now we have to set up an actual administrator. Last name, librarian. First name, the. Card number is, of course, one. Username, librarian, and a password. You also have to create at least one item type. You can add more later. I'm calling this book on the advice of the avenging chicken. And you can change the circulation rules later. You finished, you're ready to use. Librarian and the password. And this should look familiar. Now this is a fully functional instance of COA. It took maybe, well, less than an hour to install on a Raspberry Pi. And um, you can install it on other places too, other Ubuntu servers, cloud servers. Anybody can do it. I'm a community college dropout and I can do it. So let's go on to the next step. 
Well, yes, but now what? You've got the ILS, but how about the bib records? Well, this is where the barcode scanner comes in handy because just harvest the ISBN from each book. Now, obviously, every book is not going to have an ISBN barcode. Uh, paperbacks from the 80s, 90s have UPCs with the ISBN somewhere else. That's not very helpful. Uh, some of them just have it printed. And of course, some don't have an ISBN at all because they predate ISBN. But still, once you can, we'll cut down a lot on typing. And we're going to use Z3950 to retrieve them. So what's Z3950? Uh, well, it's a thingy that lets you download catalog records. That's all you need to know right now. Supported by both COA and MarkEdit. You find the Z3950 server and its configuration information to MarkEdit and COA. There you go. Put in the information, get back a catalog record. Sometimes. Uh, I'm only using ISBNs here. You can use other fields as well. So if you go to home and then administration and then Z3950 SRU serv servers, uh, you can see what you have. Um, I have on my Pi Library of Congress, New York Public, National Library of Medicine, and Seattle Public Library. It's not comprehensive, and I would add a lot more depending on what library I was trying to uh, find records for. Go to the cataloging interface, new record from Z3950, put it in. Here it is, the Cunning Man, Robert, Robertson Davies. Import, and there we go. I'm going to make one exception search by author for Z3950, looking for Molly Ivins. You can see, found a lot of her books. But this only does one book at a time. Gee, now if there are only a faster way. Oh, you might guess it is. There it is. Mark edit. What does it do? A lot of you have seen this analogy before. Someday I'll come up with a new one. But it's like a Swiss Army knife. You know, if you learn a few things, then find out it can do a few more things. A whole lot more. And I'm only going to be using a few because I only know how to use a few. If there are other things too, don't ask me. From the Mark Edit main screen, I'm going to choose Z3950's SRU client. Uh, right now, it's set up just to query the Library of Congress. Um, I found a few, just put in a whole batch of ISBNs and only Library of Congress. Uh, something go higgledy piggledy, and you won't get any records at all. So I'm setting up uh, three libraries, Library of Congress, New York Public, and Seattle Public, as you can see at the top. If you click on batch search, I created a file called sample ISBNs. Let's see what happens. I'm going to click on batch search in the file. Choose file sample ISBNs. Click search. Give it a name. And here it's searching. You can see most of the time it finds at least one record. Uh, occasionally it finds zero records. And when it's finished, it'll give you a report about what it didn't find. And that's all there is to it. So how did it do? 
Well, here's the report. I usually found one or maybe two. If it can't find the record three times, well, I was searching three databases, so it didn't find any record at all. You double click on the MRC file, and that starts up Mark Breaker, which will break it into MRK, which is basically a text file. And this is what it looks like. There's a handy feature called record deduplication. So you can search what to try to deduplicate on. In this case, obviously, ISBN is my first choice. And a few statistics. Well, there are 29 barcodes in the sample text. Found 34 ISBNs. After I do deduplicated for ISBN and title, found three, and not found five. No, the numbers don't add up. They hardly ever add up. Here's some things that didn't find. Littleton's Britain. Well, I'm probably one of half a dozen people in the US who were fans of, I'm sorry, having a clue, so that would make sense. Uh, and here's one starting with 918. I have never seen an ISBN starting with 918. So I figured that's probably a misread. Yeah, I found a few others, or didn't find a few others, excuse me. Then click on the compile button. Give it a name. And we'll create an MRC file. Now you upload them to the catalog. Go to Tools, Stage Mark Records for Import, select the file, upload it. It's been staged, so go to Manage Stage Record, Import, and there you are. So can the Raspberry Pi handle it? Well, Ubuntu has a program called Top that will let you see what the system load is. Um, it's around 0 0.6, 0 0.23, 0 0.07. That's pretty good. Uh, when it gets above 1, 2, 14, then it starts getting overloaded. Uh, it's using 19.6 percent of the CPU and out of approximately four gigabytes total memory have about half of that free so yes it can handle it but does it work well here's a staff interface with a record I did uh, advanced search, looking for books. And here's the one I have with an item record. So it all looks pretty good. And of course, now I have some more statistics. See, I tried doing uh, my own library uh, um, at work five different collections. We found 94% of circulating books, low of 57% of reserve books. I'm not surprised because there's some review manuals that are held by two or three libraries, including us. Um, I'm also working with a librarian at the Eswatini College of Technology in Mbabane. He sent me a spreadsheet of what they have. And fair to middling. I use the British Library and a few other libraries. But I probably need a good Z3950 server in Africa, which I haven't found yet. And finally, my own collection. Um, 
the fiction, mystery, and science fiction are low, I think because a lot of those are mass market paperbacks, which tend not to get cataloged. But does it work? Well, sort of. I mean, yes, it's slow. Would I use it in the big library? No. Maybe a small library? Yeah. And of course, they're getting more robust all the time. The pink one has four gigabytes. The one to the top right has two. Got that about a year ago. And probably in the next two or three years, they'll come out with the Raspberry Pi 5, which is even more powerful. So yes, I'd say it's worth a try. <laughs> And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred, for that. I don't think I've ever heard such a sort of pragmatic set of instructions delivered with such humour and fun. So thank you so much for making, so, making that so um, enjoyable for everybody. I have to offer some apologies. Um, earlier, I said the Avenging Chicken was rubber. I'm so sorry, Chicken. I understand you are fluffy and you are stuffed and cuddly and even though you're avenging, you're not rubber and I, I sincerely apologise for my earlier era. Okay, so on that note with my, um, you know, hopefully with my reputation intact, I'll take us all out for lunch. Well, we'll all head out for lunch and um, we'll... Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. Um, we'll all head out for lunch and um, we'll be back here at 2pm NZDT, which is about an hour and 50 minutes away. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Oh, this afternoon. Uh, before we go, this afternoon, New Zealand time, 3.40pm, is the uh, Koha Awards Ceremony. So do encourage people to be, um, to be here for that. And um, if you're online, I think we'll um, celebrate... On, on Twitter as well as um, just through the presentations. So we're looking forward to that this afternoon. Cheers. Nearly all New Zealanders use the internet every day. We use it for work, socialising, learning, when planning and embarking on adventures, and for capturing those special moments to make them last forever. Internet NZ is a not-for-profit and the home of all .nz domain names. The income from .nz helps us keep the internet open, secure and accessible for everyone. We provide support to increase knowledge and empower communities. We research and explore the opportunities and challenges the internet brings. And we proudly stand for the best the internet has to offer and helping people make the most of it. We're passionate about helping New Zealanders harness the power of the internet. Together, we can build a better online Aotearoa New Zealand.
FE Technologies is working with libraries across the world to give them cutting edge technology that improves the library experience for both employees and patrons. If you're thinking about library RFID, you'll find FE Technologies suite of solutions and offerings is hard to beat for a number of reasons. First, we offer a seamless solution. Our RFID products all work together to enhance the user experience, improve staff productivity, increase circulation rates and provide unmatched security. Unlike other RFID solutions that are often piecemealed together and don't speak to one another, FE Technologies offers an end-to-end -end solution that manages every aspect of your library in one place. Second, we are more than a solution provider. We are a partner in your success. Our customer project team is responsive, engaged and interested in setting up the best system for your library. Other companies will sell you some software and disappear. FE Technology is there every step of the way to ensure you're getting the most out of our systems. If you're looking to upgrade your library, contact us today for a free consultation. We've been helping libraries improve for over 10 years and no one else compares to our level of service and seamless RFID solutions. Hello, I'm David Podboy, and I'm the manager for Field Library Services Engineering in North America. And today I'm going to be talking about EBSCO Discovery Service. Since 2014, EBSCO has worked with the Koha community to build a partnership based on the opportunities presented by interoperability and configurability, as well as the creativity of the open source community. This video discusses the capabilities of EBSCO Discovery Service, or EDS, how its plugin meshes with Koha, and the work EBSCO and the Koha community have accomplished in the past year. It also previews EDS's new interface and features. So what is EDS? For those of you that aren't familiar with EDS, it's a single search box that allows patrons to search simultaneously across all of their library's electronic resources. This includes databases, a catalog like Koha, books, eBooks, and more. It saves patrons time by surfacing the best content. And when it comes to content, EDS has more than 3.4 billion searchable records with material from over 20,000 publishers, including 3,000 open access publishers. EDS does more, however, than just provide a searchable index. It helps users find what they are looking for almost immediately by leveraging a comprehensive relevance and value ranking strategy that utilizes numerous criteria, including subject indexing, map controlled vocabularies, field weighting, exact field matching, and content attribute boosting to understand the user's intent and get them what they need. In addition to its great capacity for accessing and delivering online resources, EDS can include a library's catalog records from Koha, including availability, thus enabling patrons to search for the library's physical items alongside the collection of digital materials. For Koha and EDS users, libraries have the flexibility to choose what interface they want to use. With the EDS Koha plugin, libraries can use Koha and easily integrate the EDS API into the Koha interface. Here is an example of a Koha installation of the EDS plugin, where Koha is being used to access both the library's holdings and to access EDS. We can see the features of EDS, including research starters, the content from a variety of publishers and databases, and EDS limiters and facets on the left that help a user refine their search. In summary, with the EDS plugin, you get the benefit of the EDS index with its billions of records and its relevance and value ranking, enhanced subject precision, which maps common user search terms to a unified subject index and maps concepts from its various thesauri, facets for search refinement, research starters, and more. You can also surface Koha records in the EBSCO interface for EDS. Here you are seeing an example of a Koha library using EDS to access both its catalog holdings and the EDS index. EDS is actually transitioning to a new interface, and we'll talk a bit about that now. 
The new updated EDS interface features an extensive array of enhancements, new capabilities, and an updated design. Libraries that incorporate their Koha catalog into the EDS interface will be able to transition easily to this new interface. This interface has been designed based on user research and feedback with an accessibility first approach and for mobile usage. Additional improvements are personalized dashboards, modern result list, enhanced displays, greater citing and sharing options, and enhanced detailed record and full text viewer experiences. Here's the new landing page. We've just made a cleaner, more intuitive interface. And we want to note that despite the new appearance of the results, our relevance ranking and content did not change. Improvements to the interface include a clearer indicator for which articles are peer reviewed, improved filter navigation, and items can be liked by tagging them. Based on user feedback, we've moved functionality directly to the result list, like the ability to cite, add items to a project, share references, and download, all without having to leave the result screen. The interface also has a new dashboard feature, which serves as the user's virtual personalized home in the library. It's where projects can be kept and organized and where users can see searches and items they have liked. The new interface will also connect to our new concept map feature, which is an alternate way to organize and view results in a graphical visual display. Concept map helps users make new connections and draw correlations across related topics. Users can also find hidden relationships between and among concepts and make connections across fields of study, thus making interdisciplinary research easier for specialists. Essentially, the new EDS is going to improve the discovery process for each of EDS's many resources and help every user. EBSCO will be rolling out the new interface to customers based on customer readiness. Importantly, because the new EDS will be populated from a library's current profile, there is no migration transition. In keeping with the open source spirit of the Koha EBSCO partnership, we also wanted to show some examples of collaboration with the community in the past year on the Koha plugin. EBSCO values the feedback we get from the Koha community so that we can make sure that not only is the code updated, but also so that we can leverage the contributions of the community to address issues or solutions that members have come up with. Shown here are pull requests from the past year that were merged into the core code or integrated into other PRs, representing a mix of code written by community members and by EBSCO staff. And here are some of the issues that were closed this year, representing both those posted to GitHub as well as those sent directly into EBSCO support. We at EBSCO appreciate all the contributions that have come from the community, whether by submitting issues, contributing code, or commenting on pull requests along the way. We appreciated this opportunity to share with you details about the power of the Koha EBSCO plugin and to tell you about the future of EDS. Thank you.
to everyone on the live stream. We are just sorting out a couple of uh, technical things. Our next talk is, um, we're going to swap the order. So our first talk now will be um, from David Nind, and then the talk we were expecting just now will follow. So we're just flipping the first and second talks this afternoon, and then we can go ahead. Thanks.
Hello. Uh, we're back for our afternoon session of talks um, leading up to afternoon tea in New Zealand. And then after afternoon tea, we'll come back for our Koha Awards ceremony. So um, this afternoon, we're going to switch the order of the first two talks. Um, so the person I'll be introducing now is David Nind, and he's here to give us a lightning talk on Wikidata. So really looking forward to that. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everyone. Um, I've got 30 tabs open, and I'm going <laughs> to try and work through them in 10 minutes or less. And, um, and if we can, I'm going to try and fit some live Wikidata editing so you can maybe a little bit real. Now, I don't have any slides, and it's not because I normally leave doing slides to the last minute, and then I couldn't be bothered anymore. Um, but it is, sort of. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Wikidata, and uh, there's lots of great presentations on the web, and I'm sure in the library world you've been to many things about linked and open data. Um, and at the National Digital Forum in New Zealand, there's a great video that says everything I'm going to say much better, so you could probably just watch this, but um, I'll send you all the, I'll somehow send all the links um, um, shortly um, after this. So everyone knows Wiki, Wikipedia, I assume. No one's been living under a rock, and uh, yeah. Now, what you may not have noticed, on, on every single Wiki, Wikipedia page, there's this nice little link down the corner, now I've lost it, saying Wikidata item. And then what this is, is it's a structured database of statements about things. And so if you look over here on the right-hand side for Kate Shepherd, you'll see there's some facts or some claims about her. You know, she was born here and died here and um, some other facts. And at the moment, that's all hand-generated on this page. And then if you go to the, the German version of this article, if there is one, then someone's hand-entered all that data again. And so you can see if you've got 20 or 30 or 100 languages and someone's written an article about Kate Shepherd, then um, that data can all get out of sync at some stage. So what Wikidata is, is it's part of trying to solve some of that problem with editing um, Wikipedia. So if we look at, and I'll write down the bottom, if we look at the Wikidata item for Kate Shepherd, it's a series of statements about her. So it says, Kate Shepherd, and she has a short description, and and then there's a whole lot of statements. So she's a human, and oh, here's a nice picture of her, and she's female, and she's citizens of these countries, and it goes on where she was born, and 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 whole lots of other facts. And so why why do I need to to know that? Um, and so this, oh, I'll get to that. Um, and there's. It's also set up to be multilingual as well. So, so I'm just showing English and Maori details for her. Um, but there, somebody's gone and translated those statements into, into other languages. So that's all quite cool. Um, so what can you do with this information that's all in this nice database? And Wikidata has this query engine that lets you do it's called Sparkle Queries, but if you like to think of SQL on steroids, um, you can produce lots of um, uh, useful data and representations of all the data that's in Wikidata. When I started on Wikipedia, which I've only been involved with for the last year or so, and that's mainly because of Mike Dickerson, who was New Zealand's first Wikimedian at large. He got a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation, and he went around New Zealand for a year to anyone who wanted to talk let him talk or listen to him or badger, badgering um, libraries and galleries and um, archives and running workshops on how to edit Wikipedia and how to edit Wikidata and how to edit um, Wikimedia Commons, which is all the pictures. So um, they had a session at uh, a Lianza um, presentation here that I went along to and then they had a workshop that same week um, on updating the details of libraries in New Zealand. Um, so what Wikidata likes to do is have lots of IDs for things because 
around the web, everyone's got databases on things. So there's going to be some common ones here libraries might know. So there's VF. Uh, do, do people know about VF? So it has lots of details about authors and, and librarians. Um, lots of different numbers and library of context IDs. So it tries to bring all of this data about that item um, together in one place. So in this case, the, I'm just going to focus on one ID. There's, there's a, um, the Alexander Turnbull Library as we've been have set up. We've set up an ID. Well, I didn't, but um, an ID for for this particular database. And now I can go to and these these are properties um, and uh, they take a bit more effort to get set up because they they do um, and and so in the Alexander Timber Library they've got this unique ID for this person and it has some more information about about her. Um, it also so how other places this uh, is used so Wikimedia uh, Commons is um, a free repository of reusable images. So the, one of the problems they're trying to solve is, um, well, we've got this nice info box again. But in, instead of this being um, manually done, it's done from the Wikidata item. Um, and so if the Wikidata item is updated, this page is, when it, someone views it, it's going to be updated. Cool. And the other thing it's being used for is, there's a picture of her. And if you've ever tried to search through a photo library like Flickr or other places, um, you know, you, you want to search for pictures of Kate Shepard, <laughs> or you might. Um, and um, so this is a relatively new thing. You can say that this photo or this thing depicts um, someone as specific, and this is linked to Kate Shepard's wiki ID. So you can search commons and if those photos are identified as depicting that person, you'll get all the results. So it's getting pretty smart. And I've got three minutes left, and I have really hardly started. <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip a couple of things. So what does that have to do with libraries? Uh, so, so that was a person. That was Kate Shepard. And, and this is an uh, entry for something from my hometown. It's the Omru Opera House. And um, so you can depict buildings or lots of different objects. So there's lots of different models. Now, I'm, everyone's familiar with Mark, or maybe not. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a model for books and um, resources. And, and so in Wikidata, there's lots of models for various um, um, different types of things. So this is a building. So here there's a nice pretty image, and there's um, where it is and where it's located and its coordinates. And so all of this useful statements about something build up over, over time, and you can do useful stuff with it, with, um, uh, with queries. So I'm just going to skip some of these, and that's a nice picture of Mike. Um, so I'm just going to focus. So you can describe libraries in here. So this is the Omru Public Library. And we're lucky enough, there's a nice pretty picture, and it says it's part of this. And Waitaki District and where it is and the coordinates and, and all that sort of thing. There's not, New Zealand doesn't have a specific identifier for libraries, so our identifiers are a bit, a bit low. So what can you do with this information? You're saying, well, that's well and good. It's just another database with lots of stuff. So this is a query, and it's, <laughs> I am not very good at querying, but I've dragged out. Now, we know there's probably more than 190 libraries in New Zealand, but this is all the data that's entered so far. And, um, and if we want to see where they are, because that's just a list, because the coordinates are in there, you can draw this nice little map of um, um, all the libraries in New Zealand. Now you can see there's, there's a few gaps here, and, it, and that's because I haven't done anything on this for a while. And, and Wikipedia in New Zealand, there's, there's a, a small group of volunteer editors. So, um, and there's lots of projects. And New Zealand's not very well covered compared to America where, um, and anyway. So I was, in the 43 seconds I have left, I was going to, we can see an obvious omission here. 
there's, there's no Levin or Shannon or Foxton libraries. So I've run out of time, but I was going to live add those in there. So then, you sure? Okay. Now I hope this is sort of interesting. Um, and um, so we'll skip right to the end, and then hopefully when we've done this, we can um, you can see that you too can um, um, edit this. Now I've checked, and there's no entries for for the for the for the um, libraries horror the libraries horror in there. So I will. We will add them. So when you go to add an item in Wikidata, you just say create a new item. And it's a bit like if you've ever edited Wikipedia pages, it's if you've got an account, or even if you haven't got an account, um, anyone can do it. And there's people watching things. Um, Wiki, Wikidata is a little bit different from Wikipedia. To get into Wikipedia, there's some mysterious notability criteria. and um, and in New Zealand, there's a few, no, I wouldn't call them flame wars, but someone thinks oh, this person shouldn't be in there or, or whatever. But um, Wikidata has a lower barrier of entry and it still has to be you know, useful data in here. Um, and the other thing with Wikipedia is you can't really edit your own stuff. So um, you can't create a nice marketing brochure for your company. Um, I hope someone will probably find that and um, um, do that. But you still need useful references and, and things like that. So I'm going to um, put in the name and we're going to give it a description. And this is going to be public library in... Everyone can shout out if I'm, I'm typing this wrong. So the horror... Did I spell that right? New Zealand. Cool. And you can put in aliases. So, so, so with people, for example, they might be John Smith or they might be John A. Smith, but they might be known as Albert. So you can put all these aliases in there so that when you search, it sort of knows who it's talking about. Um, so I guess some people probably know that is the Levin Public Library. Would that be right? Yeah. Yeah. And we could add some other ones in there. Um, yes, yeah, I was going to get to that. So at the moment, there's no statements here um, about this. Um, so someone could go and remove this if I don't quickly add some stuff. Um, stuff in Wikidata doesn't need a Wikipedia page, but it can sometimes be useful to set up a Wikidata item with lots of useful information, and then that can help make the case for having a, a Wikipedia page. So I'm going to add a statement, and I'm going to say this. So most things start off with an instance of, and I'm, and it's obviously not human, but if we put in public library, yeah, cool. So we'll say that. Now you probably want to know where it is. So we're going to so we're going to say it's in New Zealand. Yep, and so all of this data is coming from other statements, so it's all linked together. Um, and then we're going to say lo located in this administrative territory, and I assume it's horror. Sorry, my spelling. Cool, so we've got, there's a district in there. And we can add a street address. And I think when I looked it up before, 10 bar. All right. 10 bar. bar, bar. bar. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the bin. And that's English, but. Um, and I'll go and put the postcode in later. <laughs> It's useful if we have someone. <laughs> what was that? 5410. 5510. Okay. Now, obviously, I will go and add some references later because, you know, that could all just be hearsay and Levin doesn't actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure Joe and would, would dis probably disagree with that. So 
we had that map before which displayed all the libraries. Um, so you can put in a coordinate and location, and I did this a long time, yesterday, five minutes ago. So we've got this coordinate from OpenStreetMaps, and I've, you know, there's a nice little map here of, for where it is. Yeah. And so we can put that in there. And now there's a nice little thing there. Now I'm not sure whether it's going to happen straight away, but now if I go and and I can add more statements and identifiers and um, if there now I didn't look very hard, but I don't think there's a publicly usable picture in common. So so next time up there, I can probably take a photo and add it in and then link it to this. Um, but if we go back to that, I'll, I'll do the query first. And we'll just make sure it's, sometimes there's a little delay. Yeah, I'll run that query again. So that will, starts with T, doesn't it? So sometimes there's a little bit of delay before queries work because it gets a lot, cool. So in theory, if I run this map, um, so because it's got a coordinates, I'll, I'll just run this again. And now I can regenerate that map. And depending. Cool. And yay. <laughs> yay. So um, I wanted to do a little bit more and I've gone way over time but um, so I would encourage you even though you may not or may not be using um, uh, wiki data or some of the smart things you can do um, to to make if if you're in a library make sure there's there's a wiki data entry for your library um, or your network of libraries um, in your area um, get some nice pictures in Wikimedia Commons so that when people query it, they can say, oh, that's, that's who it is. Um, and if you're in New Zealand, most, most countries have, if you want to learn more, and, you know, libraries don't, librarians um, have nothing else to do but learn new things, so. <laughs> um, but if learning a bit more about Wikipedia and Wikidata and Commons and all the other tools um, floats your boat, then in New Zealand, in Wellington, we have a, um, and I've just lost it. We have a Wellington meetup, and funnily enough, the um, the Wikipedia it's a page on Wikipedia, and there's a meetup, a physical meetup, this week on Saturday, but I won't be there. And um, we have them in Wellington every um, uh, once a month, and around the country, some areas, particularly Christchurch. And a couple of areas have meetups, and we have an online one because during COVID, um, no, we weren't allowed to get together. So, um, and we ended up getting a whole range of people that we wouldn't normally have there, and um, and including some of our, um, our people from Australia as well who are interested in our New Zealand wiki data. Um, and then just um, hit me up afterwards. So, that's all I was going to do. Well, that was more than I was going to do. So, thank you. just for a minute more, excuse me. Um, we need to change up the order of things a little bit this afternoon um, so that we stick to the schedule for our online audience. So what we can do um, is if, oh you've unplugged though David, if there was anything else you didn't get to and wanted to let us know you could but, um, but we have I'll however unplugged. We just might be just a moment while we decide what to do next.
All right, we have a plan. Um, so, David, are you, you're here on workshops today because you're giving one, aren't you? Uh, yeah. On Friday. Yeah, David's giving a workshop on workshops day, um, but that means Friday is also a good time to um, catch David in between times for your wiki data questions. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time in between all the other exciting things to squeeze in a little lesson. Sorry, David, I just put your hand up for that. Um, Yes, yes, true, that's um, concurrent. So also another place to, um, if you want to go deep into linked data, which is sort of the concepts that David was beginning to introduce around entities and things, um, and how they, once you set the name for an entity, it can link to all things or everywhere. Um, if you really want to dig deep into linked data, um, Jonathan Hunt is doing a linked data beginners course on Friday, so um, that's a great place to go and get deep into all that kind of stuff. So, um, the plan is, excuse me for just one second while I check this message, make sure it's still the plan. Okay, so what we're going to do is head to um, a live online um, presentation, and we have three presenters all working together on this one, and we've got them live online at the moment. Um, we're going to... Um, squish that down a little bit to 20 minutes long and I will leave them to introduce themselves in this case because we do want to um, get through our schedule this afternoon without um, missing out on anything at the other end of the day. So what I'll do is we will cut to them now and um, we really look forward to hearing about um, what the good, the good and bad of Koha implementations in Pakistan which will be a great carry on from the perceptions of Koha study from yesterday. Thank you so much. You're live now. Should I get one? We haven't had a moment like this. That's what it's all about. Instructions, should I get one? We haven't had a moment like this. That's what it's all about. Instructions, should I get one? We haven't had a moment like this. Oh, okay. I know what I'll do. I'm I know what I'll do. <laughs> I just have to do one thing and just save that. All right. Okay. Um, I believe. All right. Live stream. We just. I'm just playing now. Um, so I'm just waiting to hear if we're able to get our presenters to us um, for the session. So it sounds like it still might be happening. So what I thought I might do just now is tell you about the provenance of this logo. So we saw in um, Rachel Rosalie and Chris's talk that originally we had the egg with a koru and then when the, um, the logo was flipped the other way around, so it was something dark on something white, it began to also look like a kiwi. Um, and what we did for the Kohakon 20 logo is we commissioned an artist, um, her, their name is Huriana Kopeke Te Aho, and we commissioned them to um, produce something for Kohakon, and we wanted a New Zealand feel, we wanted to keep the 
original um, logo, state the letters, and then um, for her to offer something else. And the um, potama, it's a double potama um, pattern, is what she chose to represent the um, sharing of knowledge and learning that we do at Kohakon. Um, so those stairs are like the stairs up to higher learning and understanding. So it's just a little story about our logo. Ah, well that was a good practice. That's right. So we're not we're not. It's probably because I did that dance. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we should just wait till two forty five now and play the play the recorded one. Yeah. Cool. Okay.
Awesome. Welcome back, everybody, and sorry for a few delays just now. Um, what we've decided to do is go forward to the next talk, which starts at 2.45. And so leading up into that, I just want to tell you a little story about the Kohakon 20 logo. Um, so you'll remember from Rachel and Rosalie and Chris's story we had um, yesterday morning's keynote. They told us about the original Koha logo, and um, it was like an egg and it had a koru in it. And then a few years later, or some time passed, I'm not sure how much time, and the logo was flipped so that um, the logo was more coloured in rather than negative space. And now it looks a bit like a kiwi as well as the koru and still the egg shape there. So we've got quite a few things going on that we it's kind of neat and we're happy to keep. And so for Kohakon 20, we um, commissioned an artist named Horiana, um, oh, I said it just two minutes ago, Horiana Kopeketi Aho, and um, they took the original logo, um, we gave them the text in the middle, and we asked that they bring something new um, to the conference um, logo that would bring a, um, something specific to New Zealand and build on the themes so of koha and kohakon. And so um, what we have on this end is called a double potama shape, and it's stairs, and it's like stairways to new knowledge and understanding. And um, so, yeah, we're really pleased with that logo and just wanted to acknowledge um, Horiana's work there. So um, we're coming up to our 2.45 presentation. Um, we have two speakers, and I've got one on my phone and one on a piece of paper, so it'll just be a moment. I can't read and press buttons at the same time. So we have Kelly McElliot, so it's Kelly McElligot and Jessica Zyro back with us, um, both from Bywater Solutions. And I'll firstly tell you um, what I've got to say about Kelly, but I'm just going to bring up Jessie, so I'm ready for that too. So sorry about this moment. Cool. So about Kelly, she's energetic and personable, which I'm sure we'll shortly find out, and uh, makes her a great educator with Bywater Solutions. Um, she's got a background in pu the public library sector, starting in technical services and moving on to a more systems-oriented librarian. And although her degree is from the University of Arizona, she's an East Coaster all the way through. Currently, she resides in Maine, works from home and travels to libraries, assisting with their migration to Koha. In addition to educating new libraries in Koha, she creates a weekly podcast with, with Jessie Zaro about Koha. The topics Kelly and Jessie cover in the podcast, Monday Minutes, range from upgrade features, contributing to the Koha community, and any cool unknown system preferences they think might deserve a, pro a profile of librarians, and they bring those stories out on a weekly basis, so I'm sure lots of you already know about them. And Jessie we've met before, so I'll keep it brief. Um, she has uh, graduate and undergraduate degrees in library science and got her MLIS from the University of South Florida. Um, she's been a law librarian, member services coordinator for an 18-county library consortium, and there she got the opportunity to work and train with libraries of all sizes and types. She's really interested in advocacy, outreach and training, as we can all tell from her work. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing their talk very shortly. Thank you so much, Kelly and Jessie. We are pre-recording this as we are sadly not in New Zealand and we really wish we were, but my name is Kelly. And my name is Jessie. And we're here today to talk to you about really just our journey with Monday Minutes and how this has kind of grown in popularity and in what we're trying to cover. But first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kelly McElligott, and I'm one of the educators with Bywater Solutions. And my name is Jesse Zaro, and I do marketing and outreach for Bywater Solutions, as well as education. Yes, I hope she never leaves education, Sarah, or at least somewhat. I'm constantly <laughs> learning, but we're all learners. In any position that we're in, we're constantly learning. So today we're going to talk about teamwork and doing something together, having fun, and kind of learning as we go. So we'll go to my next slide. 
So Jesse and I have been working together for almost four years and we've always been, so if anyone wants to go back and look at our old, old videos on YouTube, you'll find them. But we wanted to make sure and have a goal of being able to continue to educate the users of Koha as it gets bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. The software has gotten so large and so encompassing in the last even four years that we've been doing this, that we felt that we wanted to do something a little bit different in educating users. And also really like how people are learning. So a lot of the resources that we already have are the Koha Manual, an amazing documentation team that gets that done every release twice a year. It has screenshots, step-by-step -step instructions. We also have the Koha Wiki, and that has a plethora of other information useful to users, you know, reports and different equipment and different database things things that I don't really ever associate myself with, but lots of other Koha details. And then finally, our Koha community. We're using the community and using that Koha listserv, using Bugzilla, all that information is great and great ways for the user of Koha to learn more about Koha. And we find it really important that when we're producing material, educational material for our libraries and our partners that we constantly link back to either the manual or the wiki or somewhere on the community page, whether it's talking about a release, to make sure that that information is always included in our presentations. So again, whether it's a video or a blog post where we're documenting steps, it's so critical for the user as librarians, of course, to find that information. So where did we get that? And then that leads them back to either that manual, the wiki or the website. Yeah, absolutely. And so Jesse and I got together and said, how can we do something in addition to the resources that are already out there for different users of Koha with different learning styles and make it engaging and fun at the same time. So there we are, we're in New Zealand. Hi, New Zealand. <laughs> um, and really it's, it's about um, coming together and working together. We have such a huge Koha community and before the pandemic, we could all be in the same room and talk Koha and have a great time and have those relationships as we go to our separate corners of the world, but still feel together. So Jesse and I don't live anywhere close to each other, but we work together and have fun having that common bond of, um, of Koha. And truly, what the community means to us is truly a team. So no matter if our library is here in the United States or in India, or in New Zealand, or in China, or in Alaska, in the United States, you know, we all work together as a team. And sharing that community information is really important to us as a company. Absolutely. And I think that when we do it with each other, or we bond over this, we're creating conversations and relationships. And I know that we've built on many great ideas with each other throughout the, the community itself. But remember, have fun. And we definitely have fun. We definitely have fun. <laughs> so in this presentation, we're, we're gonna share our objective, our journey. We've been doing Monday Minutes for over a year now. So we feel pretty, we feel, feel pretty good. And some of the tools we use. And maybe you'll get a, a nice little, little blooper reel as well. So really our main objective was to take one thing in Koha, break it down, demonstrate it, talk about use cases and do it in less than 10 minutes. This was really crucial for us in the beginning because we looked at our statistics and saw that some of our videos were dropping off where people were just watching like the first three to five minutes and then and then dropping off. So we thought if we would focus these shorter videos on essentially one thing, break it down and, and try and get under that five minutes, 10 minutes max, we thought this would be a good way to kind of grab the attention of people, focus it on different modules, and then really get that information out there. Yep, yep, so we, that's what, that was our goal. 
So the three things that we've really wanted to talk about today, keep it short, as Jesse said, keep it original. So make it something that is either something that we're not talking about as much, something new and fresh, and then also keep it relatable. What librarians all around the world are using Koha for right now? The pandemic is a great, a great um, description of how that is working is we've kind of modified how we've done this because um, there are things that, yay, the Koha community created as we entered this pandemic to help everybody. And we wanted to push that out as fast and as furiously as we could to help everybody. Okay, keep it short. As Jesse said, this is a pretty nice graph. As Jesse said, it's all about time. And we wanted to get information to the Koha users in the shortest amount of time so we kept their attention. Um, it really is, look at, you can see average view duration is three minutes. So I mean, we're all busy. We all have things to do and we mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're pushing that information out there as fast as possible. We love looking at statistics as librarians. So make sure if you have any existing data out there, look at it and see what that average time is and, and kind of start, use that as a starting point um, to, you know, to launch your new material. Yeah, and this, is, this was a challenge for us because Koha, as I said earlier, is such a deep pool. We're, we have caught ourselves going, okay, let's break this into two, two scenario, two videos because we wanna show it all, but we know we're going to lose some people and we don't wanna do that. So um, here's a nice quote from somebody that we all probably know. All we have to do to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So we appreciate anyone who wants to watch these videos. We love you for that. Um, so we're trying to, again, understand that everyone's time is important. Keep it original. So we have done a lot of different things. Um, we've had various guests. Yeah. So we've had our partners. Um, we've had Lizette from Koha US, which is also another partner. Um, we've gotten to do things about Koha, using Koha, learning more about Koha. And then we've also pulled in community things. So how users of Koha can contribute to Koha, to, it, to the community itself, mm -hmm. giving back, just really getting that information out to um, the users is really important to us. You know, a few of the Monday Minutes that we did focused on like creating a Bugzilla account we kept it short. The next week we talked about searching Bugzilla. We talked about how to file a bug on Bugzilla so people could watch, you know, in three separate videos and truly understand like how things work. So it's really important to us, not only that our users understand how to use Koha, but also know how to give back, you know, to the Koha community and, and really give feedback, help sign off on patches or test, whatever it may be. And, and we want to make them feel that they are part of that Koha community. Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted to, we put this all in a big pot and we said, let's make sure we are capturing a lot of this week by week. So we've made a short little quick clip of some of our guests that have joined us in Monday Minutes. Hi, good morning and welcome to Monday Minutes with Kelly and Jesse. I'm Kelly. And I'm Jesse. And this week we're going to be talking with special guest Andrew about reports and account lines in Koha. Welcome, Andrew. Good morning. Hello. And this week we have a very special guest with us from the Central Kansas Library System, Mary Beth. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great, exciting. So Mary Beth is joining us today for our Monday Minutes to talk about GDPR. And Kelly, tell us what that is. G and this week we have a special guest with us. Hi, Nick. Hi, I'm Nick, one of the developers at Bywater. We're happy to have you here. Nick is going to show us one of the exciting new features for Koha, which is the integration of Hoopla. Fabulous guest with us this week, Lizette from the Leyta County Library District. Hi, Lizette. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you. Thanks for joining us. 
So Lizette is the current president of Koha US, and we thought we'd have her on here to talk about all the fabulous things that Koha US does and some of the ways you can become active with the Koha US community. We have a fabulous guest with us this week, Kyle Hall, and he is going to be talking to us about all the hype, the curbside plugin. Yes. Welcome, Kyle. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. All right, tell us, Kyle, how did this whole thing get started? See, and this week we have another wonderful guest, Liz. Hi, Liz, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi. Liz is joining this week, so we can talk to you a little bit about hair. Yeah. Um, this Very is good. a. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> that was fun. So the, it's been so great for us to bring in not only members of the Bywater team, but members of the Koha community to have them share their experience and their knowledge. And it really shows true collaboration. So if there's a way that you can bring, you know, partners in libraries, it's a great way to show that. Yeah. We went back into our little archive to find out our most popular tutorial videos. And believe it or not, as Jesse talked about, we did a one on Bugzilla. So you know, just how to use Bugzilla, searching, creating an account, adding comments. So engaging the Koha community by showing them how to get involved. And that shows how important that is to a lot of Koha users is that, you know, that popular tutorial video. SMS, SMS was a hot winner. It was a yeah. hot winner. Um, it's a free service, so maybe that's why it's international. So it's a great way to connect to your patrons um, without using email. And then finally, OPAC. Everyone wants to make their OPAC beautiful, and so we showed them how to use public lists to populate cover flow on the OPAC. And I want to say that we had Lucas in on that one, but I can't quite remember. I think we did. <laughs> Lucas has been a very um, popular guest. He comes back a lot for the customiza customizations. But again, it, it was, it's super great to go back and look at what people are watching. And he's a current community release maintainer. Clean. I don't know how he does it. Um, there are, are last of the three tips. Keep it relatable. So suggestions. Our partners will send us ideas. We'll email us. We'll send us um, chats through our website. We'll put it in Slack. So lots of ways that we hear from people on what they would love to see our Monday Minutes. Also, our colleagues will say to us, wouldn't this be great Monday Minutes? Um, going into the library community around what's going on in the library community. So the pandemic, bulk updating due dates, um, using that curbside plugin. What are our users doing right now um, and using Koha in what way? And then we've really tried to strive on vari the variety. So, you know, we cataloging one week, and then maybe something in the OPAC. So giving a nice mixture of different areas in the Koha um, system has been really great to make it sure that we're not pigeonholing one area of the user and not using everybody. Perfect. Tools. So some of the things that we have worked um, with you doing this um, project of ours, Zoom. We're using Zoom today as we Zoom from our house, projecting this out to you all. It's a great um, software. We, we have played around with Google Meets and we think that that could fit, fit our needs, but right now we're using Zoom primarily. We use Camtasia to do our editing of our videos, whether it's cutting out something, adding in a short little link or a um, star to say like highlight something in there. This allows us to do all of our editing. There are some free resources out there, of course, um, that you can use like Screencast-O-Matic or Screencastify. Those are some free options that you can use to um, essentially record and edit uh, for free. We use YouTube to, to house all our videos so we can organize them by playlists in different areas of Koha. So that's a great tool and Canva, which I believe is, is free to a degree um, to create our little Monday Minutes graphics. So we use that for that purpose. And then of course Koha, open source software is what we use too. 
But overall, the one thing that we want to say, using Koha, we do it every day, we love it, and we wanted to bring the fun in to our day-to-day -day work, so we get to Zoom, make recordings, send them out to you, and we've put together a little, um, a little blooper clip so you can see one, one recording and how well we cannot do it. So buckle up. Good morning and welcome to this week's Monday Minutes. My name is Kelly and my name is Jesse. And this week in and this and this week we're going to show you how to customize the social media icons that show in your iPod. I mean, seriously, what in the world is going on with us? We're gonna do it. I have a I have a great feeling about this. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's Monday Minutes. My name is Kelly. <laughs> I hear a mess. I need to. <laughs> we get the giggles quite often. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good morning and welcome to. And then we just can't wait. Tell John we're at cake five. It's, not, it's like the easiest thing. That's what Donna said. She's like, this, the, the, the easiest ones are always the ones that are the. Yeah, or just like stuff. <laughs> And there's our mic drop. So we, we definitely get the giggles quite often. If you find a teammate that you can relate with and find that good relationship that you can educate and have fun with it, you've really found a match. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. We have gotten better, but then there are days like that where we're like, we just can't win. So it's about having fun and just doing it together those those times will happen and you can edit them out like when you say the ipac instead of the opac <laughs> so what have we learned along the way since we've been doing this for over a year make it a priority we all have busy yeah. schedules you know it, it's as simple as um putting it on the calendar and that's something i'm i work on trying to contribute to the Koha documentation team, add it to the calendar, make it a consistent thing, do it every week. If again, if you find a teammate that you can work with, that's even better because they're gonna hold you to that schedule. Um, consistency, we stopped taking holidays off. So we wanted yeah. to make sure that came out every Monday because people wanted to see it. So once we started it, we didn't wanna disappoint people. Take it slow. Now we emphasize how we wanted to keep this short. Like we wanted to keep our video short. So we kind of want to get a lot out there, mm -hmm. but we realized that we need to break it down and slow down. And we have 100% at the end of a recording said, we have to do this again because we are rushing. We're trying to get too much information across or we're not doing enough detail. So take it slow again. I'm like a broken record. Koha is so encompassing. There's a lot going on and we want to share that, but we can't do it in a really short video. So break it down, take it slow. And then also that those rotatable topics, making sure that we're covering all the areas in Koha. Maybe, you know, throwing in a cereals every once in a while is good because we want to make sure we're engaging those librarians as much as we're engaging our circulation librarians. Monday Minutes has given us the opportunity to give back to the Koha community and to educate users potentially around the world. And that's, that means a lot as the librarian in us that we want to help others. And that's the, the key, give to you, take back, whatever you wanna say, that's what we're here for is to help educate the users. 
And one thing Kelly and I didn't say in our introductions, we were both librarians before we came to the Bywater team here uh, as educators. And it's important to us to not only share that knowledge, but make sure when we're presenting that knowledge that we provide that best learning opportunity for our users out there. And that's really important to us. Absolutely, absolutely. We have one more quote from somebody from New Zealand. So everything I've ever thought about doing has been in some sense about helping people. And that's really what we do as librarians, what we do for the Koha community hopefully is help people. Um, and this, this kind of, this quote really touched me and we're really again sad that we couldn't be there in New yeah. Zealand with y'all. Um, so thank you all for watching. And we're here for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly and Jesse. We really appreciate all the work you do, and I know lots of people get so much out of Monday Minutes, so thank you so much. Now, we have, as you've gathered, we've been changing things around this afternoon a bit, and what we're going to do now is try one more time to get our remote presenters to connect and um, give their presentation. Now, everyone in Wellington, um, quite possibly needs to pop out for a few minutes um, and should feel free to do that. But we really want to capture this talk, make it available to everyone online and get it recorded. So we're going to give that one more go now um, and we just might be shuffling around for a short time while we do it. So I am going to do the introduction to the talk and then we will see if we can't make it happen. We have three presenters um, and I'm going to introduce each of them. So firstly, um, someone who's been working on Koha for a very long time and was at the 2010 Koha Con is Tarasat Shapi Ola. He is an experienced professional with more than 18 years of work experience and proven in managing and leading university libraries, special libraries and community libraries. He is passionate about volunteer support towards LAS professionals and has successfully conducted many sessions in library automation, open source and free ILS tools. He's really passionate about seeing those adopted in libraries and he puts in a lot of his own time to make it happen. He's been working with Pakistan Library Automation since the year 2000 and his special skills in, in library data conversion from non-marked Mark 21 using different tools and um, has had a few international publications and conference presentations on these topics. Now joining Farasat, we have two other people. Excuse the rustling. I've got to get my bits of paper in order. Um, so we have Saima Kutab, who is a PhD student of Information Systems at the University of Auckland. Saima is investigating the governance mechanisms for sustainable crowdsourcing practices in the GLAM sector. And thirdly, we have Asif Wahid, and Asif is a librarian with the Government Punjab Public Library, established in Lahore, Pakistan in 1884. He's been there since 2007. He's an expert in various integrated library systems and was instrumental in the library's 2018 Koha migration, a project that included approximately 204,000 bibliographic records in Arabic, English, Persian and Urdu. So let me just see if we're going to be ready to go with our um, people online and see if we can start. Well to everyone putting this together behind the scenes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Frasa Shafiullah, and uh, thank you for your patience. And sorry for that um, technical hiccup. So today I will be talking through um, the Koha timeline in Pakistan. So what went well and what went wrong? 
and how it is impacting our um, LIS market. So it is just a, a very short um, snapshot of um, my country. So we are in South Asia, they bring uh, China, Iran, and uh, Afghanistan. And uh, coming to our topic, so Koha actually have many um, background aspects why um, this initiative was started by the professionals. So one, one was that in 2000, our uh, traditional university grant commission was um, changed to the HEC to uh, change the table in our university from 100 to, um, to, uh, to 200. So to look in how our HEC, uh, how our higher education will look like. So you, you, so our HEC initiative in 2000 was to add more number uh, in the universities uh, in the existing table of 100. And uh, the second point was that international ranking and quality assurance students in each university was introduced to actually um, put a competition among the universities and have a quality education, which result in consortia development and institutional repositories and web presence of academic and other libraries. From 2015 and 18, Pakistan universities start coming up on the international um, ranking um, on an international ranking like QS and uh, Times Higher Education. So that basically help us in a way that universities look how libraries should be look like and um, library services. So how this all HEC um, impacted our library sector was that with the introduction of HEC Digital Library, that was the first of its kind of consortium for library uh, sector, especially our academic libraries, since the university table reached from 100 to 200 plus. And um, that basically bring that in. The second thing was that PLA, which is our national association, they were struggling with the traditional software. Uh, it's called uh, LEMP due to the 2K issue in, um, in the programming. So that time, Pakistan Library Automation Group, ParkLab, they started to support the libraries with the Microsoft Access Trade system, which is called LIMS, which was a non mark uh, system, but it was doing a day-to-day -day, um, those all uh, functions. So if we look on the software's timeline in Pakistan, so in 1985, it started with micro and mini CDICs, which was for Pascal and Fortran. And then InMagic came, which was a priced software, and then LEMP, which was developed by the Netherlands um, Library Corporation. So it was a project between um, uh, PLA and Netherlands Library Development Projects. But after that, then when UNESCO introduced its Venices, and Window was also developing, so it goes to Window 3 to 9, uh, Window 95. So then LIMS came in 2000, and uh, by the time our HTC, as, was, as I was talking, that it was changed from UGC to HTC. So Greenstone was uh, introduced as a free software, but then people look on how standardized database, um, library data can be shared. So Mark, Edit, and Zebra was used to use uh, their data for a library of Congress Gateway. But then in uh, 2006, when, when Koha was uh, on Windows 226, that time we started, and I was one of the um, member with the park, uh, with the park lab to start. And now we end up in having the Koha on cloud by uh, Apostic, which is one of our scientific uh, uh, search organization. And it's now also have an option of uh, free and pay for support. So what factors actually contributed in OSS adoption? As I said, one was the 2K bug, which was um, actually uh, stopping the lamp to work on work on the new systems, and it was not taking the year 2001 in, in the system. The second was that UGC come to the HEC, and they were asking universities to adapt modern technologies and approaches for the education. The third one was that also they introduced the private universities charter 
which um, start another uh, com competition among the universities. And the third and and the another one was that Pakistan also start uh, putting money on ICT and mobile sector expansion, which definitely helped the universities to connect on the fiber. So they start video conferencing facilities and their HC digital library um, service for the consortia for um, online resources. And also at the same time, our um, ICT initiative by the communities of practice, like the volunteer group, Parklag, at that time, they started uh, helping people from LEMP to Vinices and to LIMS, their data so that they have a data to be able to convert in the standardized format. And looking on their practice, the other small groups came like LIPCO, LA Solution, PLW, PLC, and uh, full stack. Below that, the graph which I show that shows how, how this dominate our uh, market now. So in, if we look on the other uh, OSS initiatives for the libraries, so UNESCO, Mini and Micro CDI says Greenstone was from the New Zealand and uh, Zebra and Gas, yes, uh, as I mentioned, is about from, uh, it's a free source to put the data on Z3950 and Parkland also introduced a digital uh, library software. DSpace was in the market and ePrint. Looking on all this background that how we started was basically the change in the higher education sector and then the competition and uh, a, a more uh, emphasis on uh, ICT infra infrastructure capability. So things coming up and then library professionals, they start taking part in uh, and approving, improving their services. So current significant COHA implementation, if you look in Pakistan, that it uh, has a popularity as ILS. And we did a small survey only to the users who have OPEX and they are on the COHA for, for like last five, six years. So they have a good experience to tell that what they have. And uh, it will be very um, surprising news that in whole Pakistan, only one university is using a priced uh, international uh, provider is, is Bywater, is IBA Karachi. All other uh, implementations and sports are done by the local and volunteers. Current sustainable and, and government support initiative done by Pastic, which is the, which is a cloud Koha. And I spoke to them, they said now they they have more than 148 libraries on that cloud. So any university government institution, they can join that one free. And uh, as a volunteer, the ideal uh, implementation done in NUST, um, it was started uh, back when I came in cohort on uh, 10. And now they have all their 16 libraries on uh, their main server. And you can see, the number of items now is uh, 400, 4, 413,293 items. So it's, it's really a big number for, for a COHA implementation. In Pakistan, it is a ranked university and uh, they have um, off, uh, they have a different campus in different cities. So this was the um, operating system wise, our survey result. So if you look still, Koha people are uh, using in operating system wise, still people are have a Windows application, which they uh, they I, they have not migrated yet to the Linux, but 24 out of uh, 28, 24, uh, they have uh, Linux implementation. And uh, they mentioned about, so we asked them how, how it was, whether it was a local server or whether it was the uh, cloud. So now 14 have the local servers. And if you see the installation mostly done by the library staff, but if you uh, go back on, on, on the last one, it is uh, using clouds, it is picking up since it is a free and is government supported. So they are now coming on, on that one. This, the second the statistics, which was really, uh, interesting in, in a sense of uh, maximum utilization of a software as ILS. So you can see that all the libraries who are using Koha in Pakistan, they are mostly uh, doing cataloging and circulation pattern management. All and multiple libraries 
otherwise acquisition serials are really on a very low side plus reports they are not generating much reports uh, from the system probably it's they, they depend on all the free um, service so if if we look that what the opportunities they get through uh, this, um, in, in installing and maintaining koha so 79% people think that it is a self learning and they are maintaining it that way 17% uh, 61% they said that we get the opportunity of training so that's why we adopted that one and 57% they said that they get us um, support from IT to maintain it and 46% they are saying that they are getting from uh, help from Koha community and all other um, their peer learning and 43% uh, is support from the volunteer and from parent organization is the lowest one which is 32% probably is it's uh, one of the reason that still adaptability is not on the pace where, where it should be. So the key challenges when we asked them, it, it was uh, that how they feel uh, to be uh, being a user of Koha. They said organization challenges are there. 50% people, they feel that administration cooperation and budgeting still uh, to bring the things to uh, run it successfully. Migration challenges are out there. They have heaps of training, but still they feel that data conversion is, is um, still a point for them. Customization and local language. And uh, library staff training and experience sharing is the, the 39%. And difficulty in uh, upgrading, especially when uh, Linux is upgrading or the patch is coming, they still um, are not very comfortable on doing. So 39% is, is the uh, they feel that it's difficult and uh, for developing a strategy for long term that um, connecting the koha with the other softwares going for the uh, discovery tool so they feel it's it's still a challenge for them and uh, system they think it's a system limitation in a sense of linux is not very common so they have to have uh, that comparably look and plus the other systems in the universities they are mostly window based so the compatibility with window linux still remain a challenge and uh, they are trying to maintain their visibility on the social media but their feeling is that it's opaque is not much um, kind of um, compatible with the way they use the social media for their universities and institute they have less and poor support from IT. Many, many people complain it's 25%. Outsourcing or external assistance is expensive. Budget is always it's a developing country. So they, they feel that budget is really um, tight for them. And uh, when it's coming up, the setting up and installation, since it's a Linux, that was one of uh, the issue. And um, local support is also either it's limited available or if it is available, then it, it has a more cost as per their expectation so the point why we why we uh, touch all these people was that we want to see the koha in pakistan was introduced back in 2005 when discussion started on our email group that hcc having initiative and then from 2006 window was uh, window uh, koha was start, was start using uh, different libraries and i i did one um, Koha implementation in Windows in our legislative legislative libraries, which are presented in Koha Con 10. And uh, after that, we were thinking that probably now this is good time. People will have an example and they will go very fast on that. But then Koha community stopped on Windows and they shifted to the Linux. So that becomes a big challenge. We try to bridge the gap, but still we more focus on on the Koha side rather than on the Linux implementation. So. The things which we feel that it's, it's uh, we have hundreds of formal trainings by uh, different communities of practices, with different volunteer groups, different providers who are doing volunteer work. Uh, but these things are related to only with the installation and basic modules and data conversions. Nothing more than that. Lack of training on the strategic planning, like looking when they are migrating, how much time it will take, and how they have to migrate all their data and how they can. Uh, make it compatible with their student system or with their other uh, systems like Moodle or other learning system that they still lack that how they can do that one and they look 
towards to the um, volunteer groups, which they are only working on the way they how they can bring the COHA in. The other thing which we say that strategy uh, is, is the strategic and business challenges that the people start adopting because it's becoming word of mouth. People are sharing the things on social media, but they are not actually planning in a well and well in time so that they can uh, sustain it. Same way they are planning uh, as weak organizational assessment. They they just adopt it, but then they realize that oh, they have to look for the compatibility fitting system with the other uh, systems in in the university for the learning and teaching. So budgeting becomes another uh, challenge for them because they have less staffing. Uh, so they have uh, issues on uh, staffing uh, for uh, training and coordinating. And also they lack uh, sustainable planning and, and that if a new version will come or if another uh, operating system is coming or if, if another uh, software is coming for uh, uh, discovery, so how they will be uh, going to uh, use the same Goa data and same platform for that. So technically, um, OSS was, uh, people are familiar with you know, Ubuntu is more than, than the Debian and uh, they still de depend on seeking support from um, from the other people rather than they try to develop their own staff and their own interpersonal skills. They also have a challenge in ability to convince the institutional administration for OSS transition because it's a kind of uh, something that other all systems are uh, on Windows and you want to bring the things on the Linux. So it's kind of um, a trust and, and the training. And they also have a trust issue between IT teams and library administrators is, is that they try to use the things which easy go on Windows, but they don't want to take the things which they have to then learn for the Linux and doing those four things. And uh, when something happened or down times, they lose data and they look that what now they have nothing in their hands. So this, these are these are the main challenges people feel, and um, and and still, Koha is, is really a popular um, and the option only option available to these countries to adopt for if they're looking for a standardized database in the whole country. If we look on the landscape of ILS, so we, we have probably less than ten uh, users of. Um, the um, they one one of the proprietary softwares, and uh, then uh, I think it's only one university uh, is on uh, CC Dynex, and um, the less than ten universities are on uh, Virtua, which is probably taken over by another university. But all other universities either they are on Koha, or they are, are using their in house. So this is the whole from my side, and thank you for for the time and listening to me. If any questions, I'm happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you so much, Farisat, for being for waiting on and hanging in there with us. Um, just to let you know, everyone in the room here has hung around to hear what you've got to say, and um, we're really glad that we did. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we um, our schedule has changed a small amount, um, but um, the people in the room here probably need a quick break. So what we're going to do is take a break and for 20 minutes. So we'll be back in here at New Zealand time 3.50. So we'll be away for 20 minutes, come back, and then we're going to have our Koha Awards. Um, so yeah, hope you all hang in there with us, and um, we can end with something really nice. Thanks again, everyone.
<laughs> yeah, I am. Kia ora koutou katoa, and welcome to the inaugural Kohakon Awards. <laughs> so we can't have any, everyone here in person, of course, but we. Um, and we don't get a chance to have those chats where we thank people for their work or, I don't know, buy them a drink because they just were so awesome. And so what we decided is maybe we'll start a new tradition. Um, and so today we have some special awards. We're calling them Kohakon Special Awards. And um, we've chosen some very special people in the Koha community who have made a contribution that is... Well, that's great. I won't give any examples because that's what the awards are for. <laughs> <laughs> and so, without further rambling, I will describe the. I will um, start talking about the very first organisation that we wish to give an award to today. So, this award is given in recognition of one event in particular that is indicative of the impact of a much wider body of work that the organisers are committed to. These are those mystery awards where you just have to start working out what's going on. Um, the organisers arranged a variety of speakers from the organisations running the event, as well as representatives from the Koha community. They ran an online panel discussion and presentations about Koha in August this year, which were publicised and released with Creative Commons Attribution license, which is re reuse allowed. The, the organisers of this event are a university based in India, along with and in collaboration with their Library Information Science Professionals Association. They presented a webinar with the support of senior academics and professors from the Library and Information Science School in the wider university, and they warmly welcomed their online visitors and shared freely the learning ex a great learning experience about Koha. This event got over 10,000 views on YouTube and serves as a great reminder to us all that the reach of the Koha project is wide and various. Great things are being achieved all over the world and we are very grateful to those that share their resources and events freely, such as the power of open source. So, the award for outstanding effort to sharing knowledge about Koha with a global audience goes to the North, the North Eastern Hill University of Shillong. Thank you. 
Later on, we will share the link to the webinar so you can see what that's all about. Um, what they organised was an international webinar on the Koha Integrated Library Management System, which was organised by the Department of Library and Information Science in Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, in association with the Library and Information Science Professional Professionals Association, ASAM. So, that is our very first award to tonight. For tonight, and congratulations, Northeastern Hill University, for that awesome achievement, and thank you for sharing it with all of us. Back to mystery. So, excuse me. The second award tonight is for an elected release team member. And for these elected community member awards, I'm going to be passing over to Chris Corbeck to introduce what it is that made this person so special. So I'm going to pass you over to Chris. You're the one. Okay. I'll say. Okay. This is going to be super hard to keep mysterious um, because this person is so well known and does so much. Um, it's someone in the Northern Hemisphere who was a library, trained as a librarian, works for a library support company. So I've narrowed it down to about uh, 20 people so far. Um, they spend amazing amounts of time both during work hours and outside work hours, looking at uh, code that people like myself and Alex and Alicia and Haley and Mason and who else is in this room? I think Ian's done a patch maybe, and Evan, have you done a patch? Record? No, Evan hasn't, so, <laughs> so no award for Evan. Um, looking at it, uh, finding all the issues with it and telling us incredibly nicely what is wrong with it. Um, so I think pretty much everyone in the community has probably figured out who I'm talking about now. Uh, and so I will let, or shall I know, say the name of the award or do you just? You can say okay. if you like. So the award for the longest tenure as an elected release team member goes to... Oh yeah, Katrin Fisher. <laughs> so Katrin, for anyone who doesn't know, Katrin Fisher is the QA manager and has been since the world began, it feels. Um, she's been there forever and uh, Katrin actually has been, I hope she's still watching, has took uh, time off work and has been staying up all night watching the live stream and sleeping during the day. Um, so that's dedication just to this one. Thank you, Chris. I don't have my glasses on, I just went to adjust them. <laughs> the next award goes to someone who is the Community Contributions Champion. His involvement in the Koha project has grown over the years from attending local Koha events to attending global Koha cons where he discovered the bug for Koha amongst new friends in new places. He has gone on to be someone that frequently replies to queries on the Koha mailing list, is active in the community IRC channel, is the chairperson for various community meetings as they happen, and works hard to improve Koha documentation as a member of the community documentation team. On top of all that, he's learned how to sign off patches and has become a contributor to the Koha project code base. Yet he claims he's not a developer, nor a librarian. Indeed, he does all of this in his own spare time. So, if you have not already worked out who I'm talking about, I will now announce the recipient of the award for the greatest overall community contribution by a volunteer, and that person is... David Lind! Thank you so much, David. Oh, 
this is one for you, Chris. So the next award goes to another member of the community whose contribution to the project is also great. I will hand over to Chris Cormack to introduce the recipient. Oh yeah, so some of these awards, the first ones were kind of overall, um, well actually no, uh, kind of these ones are moving more into uh, for this kind of calendar year to date. So we thought that we'd do some kind of uh, lifetime achievement type awards, but we'd also do some for each year so that you, there can be new awards each year, otherwise you just keep giving the same people like Katrin winning every single year. Um, <laughs> so, so um, these, this, these awards are kind of for the year of 2020. And so this person uh, is probably the, one of the few members of the, actually no, there's a few of us, but one of the, the group of about 10 people who like craft beer as much as I do. Um, so that might have narrowed it down a bit. Uh, he's originally from a country that is famous for its brewing, um, especially in monasteries. So that may have narrowed it down a little bit more. He is one of the few people in the community who is uh, paid full time to work on community projects. So there, he is funded by uh, three amazing companies, um, PTVS Europe, Bywater and Bib Libra, combined to pay him a salary to, well I've said him so I've narrowed it down even more, <laughs> pay them a salary to work entirely on Koha community stuff. So he doesn't have to do any client work or anything really that he doesn't want to, which is a fantastic job. Uh, I'm seeking patrons as well. Um, no. <laughs> um, so this award, I think we'll flick to it, and then uh, this award is going to the community uh, member who has contributed the greatest number of patches in 2020. So I think everyone can figure out who that's going to be. It is Jonathan Drua or Jubu. Um, Jonathan is the current release manager, but even when he isn't the release manager, he still pretty much churns out. He's a machine, really. I'm pretty sure he's part Android, powered by craft beer. But he, he is an amazing, uh, he has done so much work, and he is always helpful and ready to give people a hand. Um, so congratulations, Jonathan. And yeah, come to New Zealand and I'll buy you a beer. I would, I okay, to run away, but That's right. Yes, Stand okay. by. Okay. Um, next up, in the same vein as the last award, we have Chris organising and organising, introducing another prolific community contributor. I shall step aside and keep the clicker ready. <laughs> so this is another one, sadly, who can't be here. Um, I think they may have actually visited New Zealand before, if I remember rightly. Uh, one of the things that as, as is as important, or I think probably more important than writing patches, is testing other people's patches. That's a, a hard thing to do, and it's a harder thing to do nicely and give back constructive con criticism in a way that people want to make the changes. And um, this is someone who's done an amazing amount of that kind of thing over the uh, last year. So this is another one of those year awards. So it's for 2020 kind of from January 1st until about Wednesday when I ran the stats. So if someone's passed them since Wednesday, I'm, my apologies. But as of, as of about then, I mean Wednesday last week, not, not, not today. I don't know what day it is. Um, it's cocktail day, that's what it is. Um, so this is a, yeah, another northern hemisphere uh, in, in a country that was in Europe and then decided it didn't want to be. Um, so that might have narrowed it down a bit more. Uh, and I think I'll just, I can't think of too much else. Oh, likes kayaking. That might have given away a bit more. And I think was a scout leader for a long period of time too. So that's probably enough mystery. If you haven't guessed now, or well, the award, sorry, is for the community contributor with the greatest number of sign-offs, so the greatest number of testing um, in the calendar year, so to date. And it goes to Martin Renvoyer. So Martin works for PTFS Europe. Uh, you would have seen him 
briefly in the community video. You can go back and pause again. He's one of the people waving. Um, he is an extraordinary individual, as is pretty much everyone getting an award and everyone in the Koha community. Um, he has served as release manager, release maintainer, on the QA team, all sorts of things. Um, he is a passionate advocate for open source and for uh, doing things the right way and doing the best by the libraries that use their services. So it's a well-deserved award. Congratulations, Martin. Wow, it's amazing how much stuff Chris remembers after he gives the award. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah, the next one. The next one is one of these more overarching ones. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be possible to... Oh, no, that's a clue. i better hand you over to Chris. Um, and he'll, this is the, um, I think, the last one that Chris is going to introduce. Um, and let's find out about this special person. So, yeah, as Catherine said, this is more one of those lifetime achievement awards. You know how they have those at the, at the music things and stuff? It's one of those ones. Um, so, what can we say? Another long-time member uh, of the community, one of the very earliest, so that's narrowed it down, uh, someone who likes rugby as much as Alicia and I do, uh, one of the few people I can talk to on IRC about rugby who, and part of the Kuha community who's not a New Zealander um, or uh, an Australian, so that's narrowed it down a bit more because there's another one there who I could talk to. Um, what else can I say? I'll try to start giving it away. They, they run a Koha support company, uh, the longest continuous Koha support company now that, that, that um, Katipu's not really in the game so much anymore. Uh, probably the earliest company founded purely on doing Koha. Uh, they've branched out and they do a bit more open source for libraries now. Um, they are one of the organisers of the amazing cheese spread in uh, Marseille, so you may have figured it out a bit more <laughs> now. And so that's probably enough hints. Um, so this award is going to the longest serving community member outside of the original um, five of us. Um, and that is... <gasps> nope. No. Oh, no. Oh. You did the wrong one. Oh. Oh. Well, Just they know. It. Okay, it's Paul. <laughs> Paul Poulan. Um, who doesn't work for the library we just put up. Um, so, and uh, what else? Yeah, so Paul and I, uh, Paul being in Marseille and liking rugby, that's quite different because Marseille is a massive football town. That's where I think, um, if I'm right, Zinedi Zidane used to play and stuff. Um, it's not a big rugby town, that's more Lyon. Um, but Paul and I have chatted about rugby. Uh, when we run out of Koha things, we can always talk about rugby. So that's good. Awesome. Now, <laughs> there's a little bit of a giveaway there, but I'm going to pretend that never happened and carry on with Glee. I mean, this is really fun. I wish there was, like, giant checks and, like... <laughs> Massive, like, wheeling in a giant cake and someone jumped out and... Yeah, all of that. Um, but however, this next award um, is for an organisation rather than an individual. And they can't be here today, so they didn't just... Um, they didn't just get given away, although they might be watching online, and hello if you are. Um, I know they've been watching online throughout the week quite closely. So I'll tell you about this organisation. Um, this organisation has a library which is free to use and open to anyone living in New Zealand. They provide information on all aspects of intellectual disability, autism and other developmental disabilities built up over many years. They provide information to anyone at all in a variety of formats including books, DVDs, journal articles, CDs, kits, whatever it is that people and their families need. For families supporting children with disabilities, their introduction to um, working with those families is to give them a free book that is relevant to their needs. They curate and supply resources for teachers of children with special needs, and the list just goes on and on. 
I like to call them New Zealand's best little national library. This library began to use Koha in 2014 and we're all very proud to support them. So, without further ado, this award is for Outstanding Commitment to Free and Inclusive Library Practices and it goes to IHC New Zealand. Um, they have a, um, they're a lovely library, their doors are always open, there's comfortable chairs, there's a beautiful view um, and yeah, they're a very committed team of librarians but most of all just that they services are completely free and they are for anyone who needs them and it seems there are very few organize few libraries out there with with I don't know what barriers to entry they have without any barriers at all okay I'm just going to check that the what slides coming next what's funny about that <laughs> <laughs> Right, da, 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 da. the next award goes to an organisation, another, oh, another clue, which, there's quite a few clues, it was all clues. This next award goes to an organisation which has had a lot to give back to the Koha community and has always done so freely. If you've been listening throughout the conference, I'm going to give this one away pretty early. So in particular, with this award, we want to acknowledge the contribution to educational materials that have been publicly published without the usual exchange of funds that most vendors would require from any user before they are willing to share, let alone making them available to anyone at all that isn't even their customer. Materials such as YouTube tutorials, Koha documentation, podcasts, testing checklists, implementation plans have all been generously shared. This organisation started when two childhood friends were looking to start a new business and Koha came along and changed their lives. They began working for their first Koha customer in 2009 and now support over 1,500 libraries with their staff, their Koha staff, Koha team and their company of over 20 employees. It is the commitment of this organisation to allowing their staff in their day-to-day -day roles to share knowledge and education materials freely with the Koha community that we wanted to acknowledge today. Therefore, this award is for outstanding contribution to Koha education and documentation and it goes to Bywater Solutions. <laughs> Thank you so much to each and every one of you at Bywater who share what you know, give what you have, and to Nate and Brendan who've enabled that right from the start. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Checking. Right. We now have a group award or a group of individuals all receiving a very special award. These people, again, it's very hard not to give this away, but um, there are a group of them, so you'll have to get them all. It's a bit like bingo. So these are the people who, without whom, many of us wouldn't have jobs. Um, many libraries in the world would have no automation whatsoever. Uh, there would be, you know, five companies left in the world supporting library products instead of 55 or more. Um, without the vision towards the future and their tenacity, their selflessness um, and their courage, none of this would be happening, not a bit of it. I don't know, maybe it would be happening different. It would have sprouted somewhere else and we all would have got behind a different cause and I probably wouldn't be working in libraries, but I don't know, I don't know what I would be doing if all of these people hadn't done what they did 20 years ago. So, we wanted to recognise the long-lasting impact of the contribution of these people to the Koha project and um, indeed that is what these awards are for. So, there are four people here Perhaps there should have been five, maybe I'll print another one, um, who I'll name individually and then um, ask those of you who are present to pop up to the front. 
I think you probably all know who it is. I can't really build it up any better um, or without saying more. So the people we want to acknowledge for their long-lasting impact and contribution on the Koha project are Rosalie Blake. Rachel Hamilton Williams. Chris Cormack. <laughs> and later on, Joanne Ransom. So that last one, I could have put some clues in to say that we also needed that person who was willing to, to, carry, to carry it forward. And many around the world did that, but early on, um, a very important person into keeping things moving was, was Joe. So Joe and Chris are here today, so I will just rummage behind me and then have something for you both. Thank you. This is so lovely. That little bit of interpretive dance by Chris was a bit distracting. <laughs> it's, um, it's been a real career highlight being involved with Koha, and while I'm not in libraries now and I've somehow managed to con my way into this conference, it's been such a heartwarming um, three days for me, so thank you so much for this. Of course, the last person who... Um, Perhaps they should have included as Simon, who was there right from the start too. And um, we all know that it takes a team, and every little decision that's made on the way can change the course of history. So, um, I kind of think if you look at the, um, you know, you look at the, all the branches of Koha and all the releases, you know, that's what you see everywhere. Like all these little sprouts coming off with all the um, different things that people contributed, and then them growing and carrying on. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you to all the sprouts. <laughs> okay. We are coming up to our very, very last award now. Um, and I'll, I'll state what this award is at the start, and um, then I'll tell you about these very special people, and some of you will, will guess quite quickly, and others will listen to the end. So this award, and excuse me for one moment, Yep. This award is for is to present these two individuals with a lifetime community membership award. Um, so we could call them an organisation. We could call them a dynamic duo. They are one of those power couples where when you say one name, you almost always mention the other one. They must know this. They formed a Koha support business in 2003 and became an ever-present ever -present presence in the Koha community. They brought with them passionate support, strong business skills, and the knowledge and experience of decades of librarianship. They were active in open source communities, not only in the Koha community, but by actively being involved in and supporting Linux Australia and also by forming the Koha Oz user group. This power couple, or two strong and valued community members, retired from actively running their business, Calix Information Essentials, in March this year. So today, it is my great pleasure to present awards of lifetime community membership to Irma Burschel and Bob Burschel. Now, I know flicking back and forth between two slides is a little funny, but I originally had a certificate for Irma and Bob Burschel, and I thought, 
That's not fair. <laughs> so they have one each um, together. Yeah, they are a koha super couple, and um, we stand here and acknowledge all of their contributions. Their 17 years of active um, koha support and all their encouragement and their advocacy over the years uh, will never be forgotten and is very much appreciated. So that is our final award for the conference. Now, Lee Rowe is uh, making an approach to the podium and I will pass over to her briefly now. Excuse me. Thanks, Catherine. I just wanted to sneak into, into proceedings and into the live stream to do an, um, another important acknowledgement, and that is um, to the Kohakon Organising Committee. Um, so on behalf of all the uh, participants in the Kohakon Conference and um, to, uh, on behalf of all um, of the Koha community, um, both in Wellington and online around the world and wherever you are, um, I've, yeah, it's just you've done a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, actually, I might get you all to come down here before I just talk a little bit more. So um, we're acknowledging Alicia, Tosca, Alex, Haley, Chris, Catherine and Rebecca, who's um, back at the Catalyst office um, doing all sorts of magic with the live stream, I think. Um, now, is this? A, will you be in the picture here? No. 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 So um, if we're just going to get them to come in so that people can see you. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, this team has done such a brilliant job. Um, I, there's obviously been so much work um, gone into planning um, and hosting this conference. Um, it's probably been the most accessible, warm and friendly conference I've ever been to. Um, I've learned so much and my cup is runneth over and I'm sure um, every, I'm not alone in that. Um, so I just want to, um, so I'm just picking up a description that Chris made before of another award winner and that was that you're all extraordinary individuals. Um, but also um, on top of that, your generosity and your sense of community. So together, you know, as a group um, and part of the wider Kulha community. Um, and, uh, yeah, so ngā mihi ki a um, And I've, oh, I've just got a little, um, some little gifts to give you. Uh, here we go. And you can swap um, the Awesome. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you for your lovely words and kindness. I'm going to shuffle some papers for a few moments, collect myself, and then I will give the uh, much-promised conference wrap-up. So uh, you will keep the stream running, but I will just be shuffling papers for a minute or two while I prepare that.
Okay. Thank you so much to everyone who has stuck us stuck out with us right until the end. Um, or if you're watching this later and you've stuck it out to the end of an eight-hour recording, thank you to you too. Um, what I'll do before I um, give a bit of a wrap-up on the conference is to sincerely thank all of our sponsors one more time. As mentioned earlier, with their sponsorship, we're able to keep this conference free for absolutely anyone who wants to attend, regardless if they use Koha now, planning to use Koha, or are just interested in open source communities. So, um, without too much more, I'd just like to, um, one by one, thank every last sponsor on the board. So, first up, thank you to Bywater Solutions. A huge big thank you to Catalyst for allowing us also to um, be the organisers of this conference. Thank you to the Equinox Open Library Initiative. We really admire your work. And thank you very much, EBSCO, for your continued support. Thank you, Linux Australia, um, and for the work you do, which supports our communities. Thank you very much. And to PTFS, who've done a wonderful job of engaging remotely with the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you to FE Technologies, and look out for their workshop on Friday. And thank you to Internet NZ for seeing the importance of extending the values of freedom around libraries and software out to the wider picture. So thank you for including us in what you do. <laughs> Libre Tech, we see you over there. Thank you so much and thanks for watching the conference. <laughs> to the Library Bar, who we're going to um, go and give some custom to this evening. Flamingo, if anyone wants to get there really fast. <laughs> and lastly, to beat Nick Books, who um, helped us out with some gifts. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, one and all. Um, your contributions are just fantastic and so very appreciated. Okay. So three days. Um, I'm not sure if it feels like really fast or, or a really long time because there's so much crammed into a short space of time that it sort of disappears but sometimes when you're in the moment and um, maybe you forget the word you're trying to say, one moment can feel like a really long time. So um, firstly, uh, before I sort of summarise how the conference has gone, um, an enormous thank you needs to go out to every single person who prepared a presentation, whether they were here in person, uh, whether they um, did a live remote presentation or pre-recorded something for us, um, and especially to those of you who travelled. In particular, I'm thinking of our um, two keynote speakers on day one, Tukahu Rolleston and Anahira Moruhu. Um, Lee and Jacinta from Toyohomai came down and, um, and Debbie, who came up from Waitaki, thank you so much for travelling and thank you to every other um, presenter who, who made it here. So, let's see. Day one. We wanted to start the conference by giving everyone, regardless of whether they're in the room with us or tuning in remotely, something that they would never get anywhere else in the world. Um, our heartfelt thanks go to Takahu Rolleston for um, filling this room with so much spirit and energy and giving us something that we could never have dreamed he was actually going to, to bring. It, it blew us all away, and I think it will continue to blow people away as they watch it. So um, a huge, huge thank you to Takahu, um, who was followed by Anhira Moruhu, the, the 
second keynote that day, and our president of the Library and Information Association of New Zealand, who again gave, I hope, a feel for some of the um, some of the things that are special about being a librarian in New Zealand. Uh, in the middle section of day one, I'd sort of summarise that. I won't talk about every talk, but summarise that middle section as libraries doing awesome stuff. Like it was just like bang, bang, bang. Three awesome stories, three awesome people um, talking about what they've done. And then in the afternoon, um, we got some sort of more advice and um, technical help from three presenters, which I think we can um, take away and go and and exercise in our work. So that afternoon is a great one for if you want to learn something new or think of things in a different way and then go and, go and um, put those into your work. On day two, we had the very special uh, presentation from the 1999 Koha Project team. It was awesome to have Rosalie Blake and Rachel Hamilton Williams here in person along with Chris Cormack. Um, and I think they really stirred us with um, how special, um, or sort of how, how fragile the beginning is and how strong the projects become. And then um, gave us the challenge to then take the values of, of sharing and caring about our communities and putting that into the rest of the way we run our libraries, and in, in, in particular in regard to climate change and sustainability. Uh, following that, we had the Kohakon community video, which you can watch again and again, so I won't talk about that much now, but I hoped it warmed some hearts and minds around the world. Um, in the afternoon, we had a, the, oh, sorry, in the before lunch section on day two, we had a great run of um, sort of three very different um, presentations and kind of just like, amazing the different things that that come out so it was cataloging plugins um with caroline which i think everyone was like yes great idea and then we had christina with stronger through integration and everyone just plowed in with loads of great ideas um that i hope we'll be revisiting and i think everyone really enjoyed that method of collaboration and then we had sharaf sal khan who um shared the study of perceptions of koha, which was just a bit mind-blowing and, and pretty interesting for a lot of us. Then um, after lunch, we had a couple more um, talks around um, ways of collaborating. And so we had um, Micah with the um, different roles within the library and how they collaborate, and then it's sort of taking that up a level, um, Ari Makaranta and Esapeka Kiskitalo came from Finland and talked to us about the Koha cooperation across Finland that they've been involved in, which was very cool. And um, and we followed that with um, some some um, marketing mouse from um, Jesse and Adam. And then in the afternoon, um, I, it was like tips and tricks afternoon because we had um, working with Messy Data, and then we had um, all these Koha. Um, call her tricks from Janet McGowan, so I think those ones will be getting paused a lot and people will be putting those into practice. And that was yesterday, that feels like years ago. And then the last day to talk about is today. So um, things started to really come together today. This morning, um, and I'll take a little bit more time over day three because I didn't do a wrap up at the end of the day for just this day. Um, so we started with a very powerful keynote from um, Julia Serrano from Catalyst IT um, on web accessibility. And I think it's fair to say that um, everyone went away with a very long to-do list. And I think um, how seriously that talk was taken um, is a testament to the values that Koha libraries already have because we're already um, practicing in the use of Koha um, the values of of sharing, um, giving what we have and um, using what already exists rather than reinventing and keeping the barriers low. So we were all well ready to hear what Julius had to say and I think, um, yeah, we've all got a lot to do and I'm hoping to do some work on accessibility over the weekend during the Hatchfest. So a huge thank you um, again to Julius for what he brought today and um, for his words to us that were truly too kind 
um, about our willingness to, to absorb his talk and listen and put it into practice. Um, picking up again in Finland, Rebecca Pilipula, um, her title, World's Best Libraries, um, I just loved the playfulness and confidence of that. Um, and towards the end of her talk, um, she expressed that she hopes everyone f can feel that their library is the very best library in the world. And I think that sentiment was just awesome. And um, she just showed such great leadership in the um, way that she's really gotten on board with Koha and is keen to see it succeed and trust the people around her to do a great job. Uh, following that, we had um, another talk to convince us and bring us confidence about moving to Koha if we um, haven't moved already, and that was from Jacinta, um, sorry, yeah, Jacinta Osman and Lee Rowe at Toyohumai Institute of Technology. And they talked to us about um, a framework for, uh, for planning a project to help you make decisions and um, see the project run smoothly and make sure you have all the skills and um, vision and, and a few other aspects together in order to um, yeah to make good decisions through the project and help you stay on track with what's important. And they told a story about their implementation, um, which will be yeah, very compelling for anyone who's thinking about moving. So thank you so much. We always need those talks to, um, to answer the questions of um, potentially new koha libraries, and there's so much better coming from you all than coming from those of us delivering the services. Then we had morning tea and after that we heard from um, Ian Beardsley at Catalyst IT who talked to us about the Catalyst Academy and um, I'm really thrilled that Ian came and did that talk because the Koha community have known about the Catalyst Academy for years because every year we have a Koha project where um, high school students come in and they have a week of learning about um, different aspects of software development and running projects and then the following week they get to choose a project and put those things they learned into action and, and make some real change in an open source project. So it's something we're really proud of and I'm, and I'm glad that um, Ian came in to share a bit more about how, what the Academy is. Um, and yeah, some of you might remember um, that, yeah, Alicia, um, has, is now the person who has been running the Academy for the Koha project. So um, yeah, thanks also to Alicia for all the work she does there. We had um, a lovely um, lightning talk from Lizette Shear about the Koha US group and I think uh, you need to watch it to see how much resources they've produced and it's great to see so many libraries collaborating um, without the need for consortium. So but still with an organisation where they can share information and um, work on developing as librarians and, and koha users. So it's very cool to hear what they're doing. Um, oh, but she was followed by um, Fred King and the Avenging Chicken, which, um, yeah, I think I said this morning, I couldn't, I was just amazed that such a pragmatic talk was so fun. And Fred, we just really enjoyed and giggled through your talk, um, as well as, Want to? Come, I had people saying that they're going to pass that to their IT department and ask why implementing Koha is so darn hard and can't they just do it tomorrow. So, job done. Good work. Thank you so much. Um, after lunch, we had um, David Nin give us a, a short introduction into Wikidata, and I think it really sparked some ideas. So, thank you, David. Um, and I'm sure we're going to pick up some more on those on the workshop days. Those ideas. And um, lastly. Before afternoon tea here, we had Kelly McElligot and Jessica Zyro from Bywater um, talking about education in their Monday Minutes. So if anyone hasn't um, looked up Monday Minutes, I'm sure they will. Um, so we had lots of lovely talks through the conference about something um, where some resources are available for us all to use. And we had people creating resources for us to use. We had people telling us about, um, asking us about marketing those resources. And then we also had people collecting and curating those resources. So um, a huge focus on education and documentation throughout the conference, I think, shows a strong and um, healthy project. And it's really awesome that we had such a lovely thread there. And um, also with the, um, we had a few talks that just blew us away with some of the big projects out there, bigger consortiums and um, or consortia and um, projects that are in progress like um, Mingu Yakuzjul's talk 
about um, his next big thing in Turkey, which hopefully, another lovely thread that came through in the conference, hopefully the work they're doing in Turkey will allow some libraries who might be less funded or have, um, yeah, might not even have a trained librarian to still automate and, and use Koha going forward. So again, Fred's talk was a bit like that too. Um, how can, with a hundred bucks, how can you um, set up a library management system? And Fred did it, so we can all do it too. So I think we can take the spirit of those talks into the next few days. Um, on Friday we have the workshops here and um, we'll be sharing what resources we can with um, the online community but unfortunately most of them are quite hands-on and face-to-face and -face, but we will share what we can. And then over the weekend um, we hope to have some opportunities to collaborate with um, people around the world and chat a bit about what we've learned this week. So um, thank you everyone. That is bringing us to the end of Kohakon conference proper, as we might say, for the first three days. Um, I do have a um, couple more notices for those of us in New Zealand, um, but before I say those, I just want to close the conference with a huge round of applause and thank everyone again for being here. Notices. So, if um, you're on the stream and you want to be here.